Our sense is the markets are well ahead of themselves in terms of rate cuts. The Fed's telling you they're going to cut, not hike next. And they're pricing probabilistic outcome into this. I actually don't see a huge gap between the market and what the Fed ultimately wants to do. They're going to be taking a read on that macro outlook to figure out when to cut rates. The market's sort of, in my view, a little bit over its skis. Every now and then, things get ahead of themselves. And to us, this is one of these times. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 totally unchanged. It is the race for the White House, the Republican battle for New Hampshire. It's down from three to two. Bramo, it's Donald Trump versus Nikki Haley. And markets are saying we're not going to care until about October. And right now people are looking out and trying to understand what the ramifications are. There are some serious policy ramifications, though. And that's why I think people are increasingly focus on what this means for taxes, what this means for fiscal sp spending, and the fact that whoever wins, it doesn't matter. Heading into that, no government official is going to want this economy to go down. This could be over in the next 24 hours. Julian Emanuel of Evercore writing this this morning, AMH, that if Trump wins New Hampshire, he could become a virtual lock and this thing might be done pretty much invincible if he was to win New Hampshire because it's going to be very hard for Nikki Haley to make up that ground. She spent a lot of time, spent a lot of capital in New Hampshire. For her, this is really a make or break moment. And it's never happened before that a candidate has lost Iowa, lost New Hampshire in the primaries, and gone on to become the candidate. So that's the history. That's the history. Let's get to the price action. Equity futures on the S&P 500 totally unchanged. In the bond market, yields shaping up as follows. Your 10-year yields just up by a couple of basis points here, Lisa. 413 on a 10-year. You know, I got to say, as people talk about the potential for rate cuts just sort of uh, carefully and surgically, you've seen longer-term inflation expectations tick up to around the highest going back to November. So I'm taking a look at this, and I'm talking about uh, break-even rates. I'm looking at this sort of creeping higher. When does this comfort with both high higher yields and a steady equity market break down, given that people are concerned about longer term inflation. I'm looking at equities, the US versus China this morning. Yes. That's the standout story. Coming up on the program, you've got US stocks at record highs. You've got China hoping to spark a bounce with a $278 billion plan. Do you want to walk us through that plan? Basically, they want to make sure that stocks don't go down. It also includes another part of this is basically draining Hong Kong of liquidity to prevent people from shorting some of the uh, the UN. So we're going to get into a lot of the details. What I find interesting about this, though, is that divergence. Does this mean that the U.S. and China have really decoupled? Because you're not seeing the knock on to the U.S. either economically or from a market's perspective. Well, look at the difference right now. <laughs> Equity highs, equities at all-time highs in America and China coming up with a plunge protection team again to try and put a floor under its domestic equity market. And even though you saw some sort of bounce in Chinese equities, they're still down about 10% year-to-date. Year-to-date, I mean, we're not even through January. So just to give you a sense of how far they've fallen. Brutal. In about 15 minutes, we'll head to New Hampshire just to have a look at this race between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley with a Republican strategist. Don't miss that conversation. Then later on this hour, attention turning to tech away from financials. Netflix, AMH, coming up after the close a little bit later. Yeah, and they're supposed to be adding subscribers. I was looking at these churn rates of all these streaming platforms, and apparently Netflix has the lowest in terms of the churn rate. So if you feel like at this point in your life you're adding too many of these streaming platforms, Disney, Amazon, etc. People seem to want to hold on to Netflix. Big tech just around the corner. Let's begin with our top story. U.S. stocks at record highs. China hoping to spark a bounce. Luke Cower of UBS Asset Management saying fundamentals back the rally in the U.S. but staying neutral on China, writing this. The property sector overhang and geopolitics likely weigh on how much valuations can positively re-rate. Economic support for important industries doesn't translate efficiently into profit growth. It contributes to excess production and lower margins in industries Beijing is trying to prioritize. Luke Carr of UBS with us around the table. Luke, let's get straight to it. Almost $300 billion offshore money from state-owned enterprises to go back into the equity market in China. What do you make of this move overnight, potentially, potentially? Well, I think uh, investors are going to be pretty heartened to see this expansion of the, the policy toolbox, at least in the short term, so to speak. I think that's a positive. Uh, kind of zooming back, if you zoom out on the chart here, uh, it doesn't take a CMT to realize that this is a level at which 
uh, Chinese stocks, broad, uh, broad offshore indices especially, should be responsive to anything resembling a positive catalyst. So when you talk about our positioning, this is a reason to have been you know, neutral and not uh, you know, very underweight Chinese stocks. It's the fact that you know, as you kind of approach these levels, as the equity market becomes a bit more of a concern for Beijing, as the economy has had in the past, they're going to do something. This is something in terms of the longevity. I'm a lot more interested in looking at what the FX implications are, because, you know, in particular, we've got this strong dollar move to start the year. And you know, typically, you really wouldn't expect a kind of big move, big outperformance in Chinese equities without also a concurrent big downdraft in the dollar. So I'll be interested to see the degree to which that kind of cross asset uh, correlation holds up in the near term. John, have you ever noticed how different people's tone is on the record and off the record when it comes to China? I'm just saying, you know, there's this question of the sort of formality of taking a look at the different steps and other people saying, what are they going to do next? I mean, essentially, when you talk about FX, they're draining liquidity from Hong Kong to stop out short sellers of the UN. Does this change the game in some capacity and make you think after being positive on China, it's starting to look a little uninvestable? Well, I would say in terms of the like draining liquidity from, from Hong Kong and that angle, I think that's a play we've seen before in the cross-asset space, not re necessarily in equities really, but that's certainly uh, something we've seen in terms of you know squeezing uh, dollar CNH in the past. We've seen these tools brought to bear. So in that sense, not really that much of a, of a new thing to have had happen. A different frontier, a different realm, but not necessarily that new of a tactic. We had Alicia Levine sit in your seat just yesterday and she talked about the difference between the fundamentals and the governance issues. The economy in China for the last 10 years has been growing pretty steadily. The equity market has been an absolute dog. Is it about growth and fundamentals or is it about governance issues? The unstable, unpredictable policy coming out of Beijing. Well, I'd say a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B here, just because of the uh, the earnings growth story, which should be fundamentally underpinning equities. It doesn't happen as strongly in China. And you've seen that be, you know, blatantly a, a policy decision in some frontiers of you know, the for-profit education, a smaller part of the market, but the most extreme example of you know, what is happening when a you know, sector is not seen as furthering the common interest of, of China at large. You've seen this uh, more in a more market cap moving sense in terms of the internet platform companies. On the, I think you can make a lot more, and we've seen this in the US, you can make more a lot more cons wave away concerns about governance when you're able to grow very fast and translate that into earnings growth. In China, you have the kind of concerns about governance at the, the micro level, you have kind of more macro level geopolitical concerns, and then you have a fairly decent history now of not that not having a great sharp ratio on your profits, so to speak. Given the concerns you see in China, where do you think foreign money will start to go in EM? Because you like other parts of emerging markets. So yeah, we do we do like EMX China, and that's been the a story of well, uh, if, if China does possibly in fact, you probably get some positive spillovers there. Uh, I think we do really like the the Asia X China, uh, the semi story rebounding there. You have seen kind of semi prices rebounding. You've seen Korean exports picking up steam. PMIs in the region troughing. Uh, you know, so in the equity space, those are regions that look particularly attractive. In the more carry FX space, uh, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, those still look like some of the the, the safer places for carry for us. And I, I think a big, big beneficiary, it's not in the EM space directly, but of uh, investors' relative aversion for China for some period has been Japan. I think the, the combination of the, of the corporate reform story, Japan being one of the probably best plays you have on a quote unquote new normal for GDP growth uh, coming, you know, following the pandemic. And the fact that monetary policy hasn't been as responsive there, helping the kind of the profits grow through the, the currency impact. I think all of that has really helped uh, Japan at the expense of China so far. I, I'd be watching that very closely in the next uh, couple of days because that's probably something that will be at least reevaluated as investors try to measure how much these China stimulus moves matter. Can you just elaborate a little bit more when you say reevaluated uh, with your Japan bet, given the fact that you have seen this real consensus into Japan and real questions about when they will abandon negative rate policies? Today wasn't the day. What do you mean that people are resetting it, rethinking it? Well, I, I just think quite simply in terms of looking at more regional, uh, long, short equity positions, I, I think, you know, Quite clearly, there's uh, the there's been elements to Japan that you know, do have uh, the the feel of a lot of momentum chasing. Obviously, the momentum has been against Chinese stocks for a while. So, just quite simply, if you uh, if you tightened up your stop loss 
on a Japan-China trade uh, in light of how well it's run. Uh, this might be you know, a bit of a time where you start to see whether those get hit or not. So uh, it's a market I'll be watching closely just to see the, the ripple effects from these moves out of China. Luke, let's bring it back to the United States and talk about the leadership in the equity market domestically in the U.S. It's come from big tech over the last 12 months. Do you still see reason to believe that can broaden out, that breadth can improve as the year develops? I, I think we do, and uh, a, few, a few of the bigger reasons are why or, or the resilience of growth underlying. I think the, the earnings story, it has been and will be for this earnings season quite narrow, but uh, by and large, we've seen 2024 estimates hold up very well. I do think that speaks to the, the level of breadth uh, that we're going to see in profit growth going forward. You know, I think uh, another element is that when you talk about long-term correlation, John, I know you've often brought up banks trading off the yield curve, banks trading off the level of yields, that may be not mattering so much. One of the biggest beneficiaries of lower yields is, is going to be the banks, in particular uh, smaller banks. So that, that's a place where we see normalization in the economy, not easing to respond to a downturn as probably supporting some of the more cyclical sectors. I think when you get that in combination of, this is an extremely, extremely long uh, cycle of having manufacturing PMI is sub 50. Any signs of manufacturing uh, pick up there just based on normal inventory correction cycle. This is something that should help breadth increase in our view. Do you think that we really have decoupled this idea of bonds and stocks? And even if yields go higher, you can still see that resilience in the US uh, stock market. So that our, that's our big call for the year. Our big call for the year is, and it's quite frankly happened a, a lot faster than we would have anticipated, especially you know coming out of uh, November, December. Our big call has been uh, soft landing. It has not been uh, efficiently priced into stocks. It was overly priced into bonds. And that the surprise of this year is stocks at record highs without a rally in bond yields. So you know this is our view. We think it's you know fairly consistent uh, with what's happened so far. Uh, that that does mean we have to be on the lookout for for what's up next. But you know, certainly I think it is, and it has a lot to do with the fact that you know you can deliver what's priced into the curve or even less, and still have yields just fairly stable. I, I think it's just the the view that. As we get into this year, I think a, a big stepping back thing is that we're going to see what kind of economy we have uh, as, a lot of, as a lot of the dislocations dissipate. And it's going to be something probably in between pre-pandemic and pre-GFC. So I think that sets you up for a lot of nice trading ranges and rates where you know where things, quote unquote, should be if you're using those as benchmarks. So far, good news has been good news, Bramo. So far, at least, for the first couple of weeks of this year. How much did Stuart Kaiser pay you to say that? I'm just it's saying. True. Based on what we saw in the last <laughs> week, claims lower, retail sales hotter, consumer confidence picking up, yields actually started to bleed a little bit higher and equity still rallied. Okay, not to be the naysayer or the pessimist, because I, I'm, I'm actually not. I, I think it's good news. It's no, good of news. course not. But longer term, you are seeing inflation expectations pick up. And I do want to watch that space very closely, because if you get this idea that rate cuts now will mean longer term higher inflation, that changes the equation just a little bit. Luke, stick with us. We've got to talk politics next. Equity markets on the S&P 500 totally unchanged. Let's get you some headlines from elsewhere, from stories around the world. We can catch up with your Yahira Hackers with your Bloomberg Brief. Good morning, Yahira. Good morning, John. The New Hampshire Republican primary is underway. Nikki Haley winning six votes in Dixville Notch, the first place in the nation to cast ballots. Frontrunner Donald Trump aiming for a commanding victory in the Granite State, which would make a November rematch with President Joe Biden more than likely. The Boeing fallout continues as one of its biggest customers signals waning confidence. United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby has reportedly been venting his frustrations with Boeing management and their handling of the 737 MAX 9 grounding to Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. The FAA is increasing its scrutiny, asking airlines to inspect door plugs on an older 737 model. Samsung is reportedly exploring the development of a blood sugar monitor that doesn't break skin. The device would allow non-invasive glucose monitoring and continuous blood pressure checks. The company is setting its sights on ambitious healthcare goals against Apple and Google, who already sell wearables with features that track your health. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Appreciate the update. Up next on this program, the battle for New Hampshire. Now we're down to two people. And I think one person will be gone probably tomorrow. Chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray. 
That's coming up next on the program. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance live from New York City this morning. Good morning. nominating contests are here and the candidates are making their cases to New Hampshire voters ahead of the primary. New Hampshire is going to speak very loudly. Bloomberg is live in the ground bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. Nikki is the one that has knocked all these other candidates out of the race. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? Coverage continues today only on Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Just about positive on the S&P by 0.02% on a 10-year this morning. Yield tire by two basis points. Your yield, 4.12.82. Under surveillance this morning, the battle for New Hampshire. We started off with, really, if you add some Democrats into it, we started off with 13 and now we're down to two people. And I think one person will be gone probably tomorrow. Yeah. And the other one will be gone in November. Chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray and have a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos because we won't survive it. Here's the latest this morning. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley giving their final pitches ahead of the New Hampshire primary, with some polls showing Haley gaining ground on the former president's lead. Matthew Bartlett of Derby Field Advisors saying, quote, it appears that the GOP is simply not ready to turn the page on Trump after New Hampshire. We could be headed straight into what is expected to be a brutal, ugly, and Anne-Marie bitterly divided general election. And it's the election, Jonathan, Americans don't want. They don't want to see Trump versus Biden. So the Wall Street Journal this morning is saying if Brian Kemp, Governor Kemp, which we interviewed in Davos, was able to beat Trump, maybe Nikki Haley can, because Trump tried to unseat him and it didn't work. So they say only four of the 15 states voting on Super Tuesday limit voting to registered Republicans. This gives Haley a fighting chance, but only if she abandons caution and wages a full-throated campaign against Mr. Trump to be sure that would jeopardize her future in the GOP if she doesn't win. She has two options, go quietly or go for it. She should throw her Hail Mary. In this uh, opinion piece, Jonathan, they talk about a nuclear option for her to really go up against Trump. Let's discuss those options right now. Joining us, Matthew Bartlett of Derby Field Advisors. Joining us from New Hampshire. Matt, great to catch up with you again, buddy. Why would New Hampshire be any different to what we saw in Iowa a week or so ago? Well, it is unclear uh, if that will be the case. New Hampshire was the site where Donald Trump got his first win in 2016. It is very possible that, that tonight he will get his final win uh, to seal the deal with the nomination. Now, the only thing I would say is 40 percent of the electorate here is independent voters, meaning that they can vote neither the Democratic or the Republican primary. So New Hampshire is always a bit of a wild card. Nikki Haley is the only person left in this race. She's contrasting against President Trump, but it's unclear if she can truly um, beat him uh, in the nomination process. What more could Nikki Haley have done in New Hampshire, this state where she spent a ton of time and a ton of capital? Uh, that's Anne Marie. That's a great question, um, and no one really knows. Um, it seems as if there were plenty of people in this race, like Chris Christie, that directly attacked Donald Trump, and the Republican base simply did not want to hear it. Um, she has tried in in the recent days to to really question some of his uh, his misstatements, um, even his mental capacity, saying that um, you know Joe Biden is too old, Donald Trump may be too old too. Um, but right now, the the Republican Party has you know views the former president in a very very high regard, um, as stated, they're not looking to turn the page. And then beyond that, there was probably, you know, a year ago, uh, an opportunity. Uh, Ron DeSantis was even beating Donald Trump in the polls in New Hampshire. Yet what have we seen for the past six months? Head to head polling that shows Donald Trump potentially beating Joe Biden in many of the swing states. That has been a psychological factor that has been truly underreported. It has only emboldened his base to come out and vote for him. And now there's a feeling of inevitability. You've seen the race, uh, co you've seen the Republican Party coalesce around Donald Trump and possibly even there's bigger buzz around who could be his former, uh, who could be his vice presidential pick rather than can Nikki beat him here in New Hampshire. 
So she does lose and the polls are correct. How does she recalibrate? Is that it for her or does she fight on? You know, uh, you go back to the old country song. If we can make it through tonight, we will worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. It is unclear what her path is or if she has a path to the nomination. If she were to pull off a stunning and historic uh, victory in New Hampshire, a la Bill Clinton 1992, I think you will see, you know, donors come off the sidelines, national attention, uh, voter attention nationwide. You'll see those polls move. Consequently, um, if she does not, there will be enormous pressure um, from the press, from the voters, from, from Republican activists to exit the race. So all is unclear, but tonight here in New Hampshire, we'll have much more focus. A lot of people are just expecting we're going to have a very long general election, Matthew. Who does that benefit more, Biden or Trump? Unclear. Um, as as Emory said, it seems as if both parties are really wed to their nom their nominee. Yet the entire country is really looking to move past both Donald Trump and even Joe Biden. So it will be a tough, bitter election fought on issues as well as feelings, sentiment, attitude. Um, and the possibility of a third party um, entering the race. Could it be Joe Manchin? Could it be a Chris Christie, um, RFK Jr.? These are really wild cards in what would be a very, very close election. Let's remember Donald Trump kind of snuck one past the goalie in 2016 with a margin of victory in the swing states of about 70,000 votes, lost in 2020 by about 30,000 votes in the swing states. So it's going to be a very close election. Um, but as said, I think the country is really not looking forward to this. A lot of this makes me think of what David Rubenstein even floated this past summer, which was Joe Biden going to Donald Trump saying, listen, I will pardon you. I will get rid of work to get rid of some of these legal issues in the states uh, if you don't run. And you know what? If you do agree to that, I won't run either. Seems to be a bit of a dream coming out of Wall Street that maybe the country would have preferred. <laughs> But we're heading towards a general election. Hey, Matthew, great to get your view, as always. Matthew Bartlett there of Derby Field Advisors. AMH, bit of a dream, just a little bit. It is an absolute dream. It's like when people come to me and say, is there any way Joe Biden's going to cast aside Kamala Harris and pick a new VP? That is not how things are done in Washington, D.C. There was no way that Biden was going to pardon the former president. Luke, how does the politics matter this year to markets? Certainly will. It'd be you know, crazy to say they wouldn't, the way you've had you know, Burkett's move a lot on different political events, whether that be Brexit, whether that be the, the first election to Trump. I would, I would say that kind of one thing we're discussing more and looking into is, does the presence of a race that's decided so early and the, the Davos consensus is, is clearly what it is regarding the, the outcome already with a, um, I'm, all I've heard out of that is the, the prediction that uh, Trump will win again. Does that provide the ability to price in potentially implications of the election far, far more ahead of time than we otherwise would? And, you know, that's certainly something we're going to be looking at in the days and, and weeks to come. But I thought the whole idea of Davos is you look at that consensus and you do the exact opposite of what the Davos elite tell you to do. But when you actually do look at the election, isn't the timeline on Joe Biden's side when you look at all the economic data coming out and the top issue for Americans is the economy? I'd certainly say that the timing of some of the inflections you've seen in consumer sentiment would, would seem to help uh, President Biden, I think uh, Neil Dutta at Renaissance Macro, I think he's a friend of the program, has you know, previously outlined voter share connected to economic sentiment and about how you know that would potentially bode well if, if such a trend continues. Uh, but by and large, if claims are this low, if gas prices are this low, uh, it, one would think that should matter. On the other hand, is this really an election about the economy? I'm not too sure. Or is this an election where you know you focus very highly on what the best pollsters are saying in five states and, and trying to get a handle on that as to how things will actually transpire? We often say that, don't we? We sit here and say it's all about the economy. It's about the economy. And then it comes down to two things, abortion and immigration. Well, and also, H, is that it? Well, it also comes down to swing states and who's getting out the vote on those issues. Democrats are going to want to make it about abortion. But poll after poll shows Americans care about the economy. So if the economy is in a good place, maybe then their secondary issue becomes an important issue for them, whether that's immigration or abortion. Hey, Luke, good to see you. Luke Kelly oh, of UBS Asset Management, breaking down this market and the politics for us. Equity futures on the S&P 500, totally unchanged at the moment, slightly negative. Coming up on the program, Brian Weiser of Madison & Wall, looking ahead to earnings from Netflix. You've had the big players on Wall Street, the big players on the West Coast are just around the corner. Live from New York City this morning, good morning.
Live from New York City, check out the price action on the S&P 500. Equity futures almost totally unchanged on the S&P, negative by 0.02% after closing at another all-time high in yesterday's session on the Nasdaq. A similar move, pretty much unchanged as well. The bounce of the Russell continues up by three quarters of 1%. Some earnings news out there. Let's cross over to J&J and have a look at EPS at 229, the estimate 228. I have to say, a bit of a snooze here, Lisa. Reaffirming the forecast, no big fireworks in this one. What I think is interesting is that the shares are down. And even though there are basically no big fireworks and that they basically beat by a hair or a cent, uh, you're seeing a negative share reaction, which is actually pretty much what we've seen across the board with other companies that have either beat uh, or you know, been in line. It hasn't been that big of a pop, even when they've been able to deliver. And I wonder if that's going to be a theme. That's Jay and Jay. Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year in Treasuries. Here are the scores for you. You ought to look like this on a two-year high by a single basis point. 440.61 on a 10-year up by two basis points. 412.62. Jan Hansius, Goldman Sachs, catching up with the team at Bloomberg over in Hong Kong. Bramo talking up a move in March. A move in March where I've heard from pretty much everybody else pushback to that call. There is company at Bank of America. Michael Gapen also seeing a move in March. We'll catch up with him a little bit later. And this is because some people see some sort of deterioration on the front uh, when it comes to some of the economic data. Right now, just to give you where markets are pricing this, it's now 40% chance of a March rate cut. That's down from some 86% at the peak of all of these excited uh, feelings toward rate cuts. A lot of people are eyeing June. So March is now not in consensus. You're tired by, let's call it two basis points. Let's turn to foreign exchange. ECB meeting in a couple of days' time. The euro looks like this against the dollar. Negative here by 0.2%, 108.63. If you think the euro's a snooze, the ECB is not. President Lagarde, according to several reports, first reported by Politico yesterday, criticised in a staff union survey marking the halfway point of her eight-year term, a slight majority of respondents in the December poll assessed her presidency as either poor or very poor. Many criticise Lagarde for spending, quote, too much time on topics unrelated to monetary policy <laughs> and going too frequently, Lisa, into the political domain. And what was shocking about this survey is how much it diverged from the predecessors, her predecessors at the ECB, where there was a lot more support. Are her comments on Trump making people dislike her? Are her sort of political forays making people feel like she's not representing the monetary policy, the nuts and bolts of economic theory? I don't know the answer to that, but the survey kind of speaks for itself. I'd say a couple of things about this. There might be a pay dispute of the last couple of years that have maybe poisoned the waters at the European Central Bank between the top of the ECB and at the staff level. I'd also say this about the European Central Bank. I bet, my view, if you surveyed the governing council, so the National Central Bank governors and the executive board on what they think of Lagarde versus the previous governing council underneath Draghi, I imagine there'd be more tension around Draghi than there is around Lagarde. Because what I've seen from Lagarde is a consensus builder at the governing council level in a way that Draghi never was. Draghi's strategy from the outside looking in was basically to get everyone into a corner and say, this is what we're doing, you're coming with me. And you saw a lot of unhappy central bankers off the back of that through that period. I don't see the same thing under Lagarde on the governing council. So the staff might be super unhappy, there's reason for it. And we've been talking about her weighing into politics when maybe she shouldn't. But I bet you if you polled the governing council, they'd have a different view on this. I wonder if there's a larger theme that you could take from this, and not to go too astray, but strong leadership styles. It sort of uh, isn't great for people who might want to weigh in at the top, but maybe it makes for a clearer mandate at the bottom or in the middle ranks. And that maybe is part of what's contributing to this. But I agree with you. People are able to have their own opinions and voice dissent, which, you know, we've talked about how that's the refreshing base. The central bank, though, is coming out and the spokesperson saying this is flawed. And because of that, it's less than 25 percent of individuals who work at the ECB weighed in on this poll. I'd like to see what 100% of these individuals have to say. I imagine it might come up with the same thing, to be honest <laughs> with you. I expected that pushback from the ECB. I think the ECB also said that you could fill in your name and do the same form twice or something like that and do multiple responses, but whatever. The fact that it leaked just tells you everything that yeah, you need exactly. to know. I mean, that's exactly. really, it's, that speaks volumes. Let's get to the top stories this morning. Under surveillance, authorities in China drawing up a $278 billion rescue package for the slumping stock market. Pressure building to act with the benchmark Shanghai index touching a five-year low this week. More than $6 trillion has been wiped out from Chinese and Hong Kong stocks since the peak in 2021. China-linked equities in the U.S. also under pressure. The Nasdaq Golden Dragon index down over 15% to start the 
the year. The plunge protection team regrouping offshore this time, Bramo, reportedly. What was interesting to me is that this is coming without necessarily a commensurate package of economic bolstering uh, that a lot of people are saying is required in China. You're also seeing the shares down in China about 10 percent year to date, even with the pop that you saw overnight. So a real question of what they're trying to accomplish here. And exactly, does this make China more investable for people who basically have abandoned it, as we've seen from foreign direct investment? Alicia Devine said it yesterday, basically uninvestable. Voters in New Hampshire are heading to the polls today in a matchup between Republican presidential hopefuls Donald Trump, Nikki Haley. Trump leading by double digits in final polling. Haley looking to rally anti-Trump Republicans after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis ended his campaign over the weekend. The next major contest is in Haley's home state of South Carolina on February 24th. And AMH, there is one question. Will it even get to February 24th? That's the big question today, because if Trump wins New Hampshire, it does feel like he's invis invincible. And this is favorable ground for Nikki Haley. You have a lot of Republicans here who want to do away with Trump. They care about issues that she's trying to uh, Codrill up when it comes to fiscal policy, when it comes to things like how she views foreign policy. This is the gr this is the place she can win. So if she doesn't win here. It feels like it's over. Let's finish on this story from United Airlines. Losing confidence in Boeing after the grounding of the 737 MAX 9 after mid-air emergency earlier this month. According to Bloomberg, United CEO Scott Kirby is appealing to U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg to act following his frustrations with Boeing management and their handling of the incident. United gaining in the pre-market after raising its 2024 guidance when it announced fourth quarter results just yesterday. United this morning is positive. On the month, Bramo is down about 9-10%. All I can say is I can understand the frustration given that there hasn't been real clarity on when they can bring some of these MAX 9 jets online. But it just highlights how challenging it is for Boeing that you have, again, leaked the idea that Scott Kirby is coming out and saying, Fault calling short for a complete overhaul of management, but pretty close to what's going on, guys. We counted on you. We ordered your planes. We actually were one of the biggest buyers, and you let us down, and we can't fly these. I mean, that's got to be such a frustration and the reason why maybe you're seeing a more motley outlook going forward. Not the only airline boss who's complained about this company over the last year, is it? No. Michael O'Leary sat around the table with us from Ryanair complaining about delays, and I think those delays are getting more delayed. But Michael O'Leary has more of perhaps a colorful personality when it comes to saying some things, the quiet parts out loud. Scott Kirby strikes me as more buttoned up. So I'm just sure. throwing that out there that, you know, personality thing can also, you know, Michael O'Leary kind of speaks his mind very freely, which is so refreshing. Uh, and some other people maybe don't as much. United stock is up by something like 2%. Netflix coming a little bit later, reporting after the closing bow today. Analysts expecting that company to beat its own forecast for subscriber growth. Ahead of earnings, the streaming giant announcing its film chief is leaving the company in March. A lot of turmoil in this industry. Brian Weiser, the Madison and Wall principal, joins us now around the table. Brian, good morning to you. Good morning. Good to catch up. What is Netflix doing that seems to be crushing everybody else? I, they continue to invest in their business. I mean, that's the thing. When you look at the rest of the industry, go back to 2019, uh, Disney was talking about massive investments. And I always thought they understood what the profitability would look like, which is terrible. Uh, they clearly didn't. Um, now, if they'd only kept to that plan, and if everyone else had kept to the plan too, I think they would have positioned themselves much better. Netflix would have been much weaker. Instead, we have Netflix, really the only one who's really, really committed, at least among the big public guys, right? Obviously, Amazon is, Apple is, um, but among the traditional media companies, it's almost like they're giving up. Well, what does it mean to invest in the business now? I remember when we were in the whole content is king cycle, which seems to have died with Disney and seems to have died with this idea that people are going to strike and it's expensive and they don't really want to do that. So is that what it means to invest in your business or does it mean cracking down on password sharing and cracking down on uh, just how you expand and compete with your competitors? I think that's all part of it. Content investment is king. That's the critical thing, like the willingness to put money to work. And increasingly and importantly, a tolerance for lower profit margins. This is the math that I didn't quite understand or think about when I was an analyst covering the stock back in 2019 but before. Basically, if you have a business that says a 20% margin business rather than a 30% margin business, sounds bad, right? Unless you're twice as big and you're operating globally and you're scaling your costs much more broadly. That's where the math works. But they have to keep investing. And again, that's where Netflix is actually really well positioned. Before we dig further into the nuts and bolts, I am curious. Do you expect them to talk about artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, writing uh, our scripts? Uh, I'm serious. I mean, it probably could really lower their costs. 
I doubt it in the context of Netflix specifically. I think AI will definitely be a big issue this earnings season when it comes to uh, Meta, to Alphabet in particular, because it's driving so much growth. Agencies as well. There'll be a couple of investor days coming up this week. Uh, Publicis has one just focused on AI. So you will see a lot of AI talk in the industry, but not in Netflix. You're talking about how content is king. They're about to lose their head of film. This is an individual who brought Martin Scorsese to Netflix, Spike Lee. How concerned should the company be, and how do they go out there and attract a new top talent? Yeah, I don't doubt that losing someone like that is not, not good uh, for them. But on the other hand, they also have a very deep bench. They, unlike a lot of the other studios, are willing to invest. I keep coming back to that point. Because I was just looking at this before. If you look at the enterprise value, not just equity value, but the enterprise value of Warner, Paramount, Fox, uh, you could go down the list. Literally everyone but Disney and Comcast, they don't even add up to Netflix. I was looking at the churn rate of some of the data about when subscribers are just like, I have too many of these streaming platforms, I need to get rid of something. Everyone else is averaged about 5%. Netflix is at two. So has that become the base for customers? Like Netflix is my base and then potentially I'll add on something else? I think so. That's the advantage of a really deep library. I mean, there is always something on, as we were talking about before. Like, I can't even remember what I saw yesterday because I just plowed through something. <laughs> and there's so much content. And that's a good thing, as long as they can actually manage the economics of it and do it at a, a profit margin, keeping to investing towards scale is what matters most. And Brian, it seems that everyone's got something to say about Bob Iger and the job he's doing over at Disney. Has anyone offered a solution? What is the solution? I've not heard one. I, I think that it's, they do seem a bit adrift, right? If there was a lot of strategic clarity uh, going into his first retirement, uh, they knew what they were doing, they had a very clear plan, and now it's kind of all over the place for the last year and a bit. Um, he's floating ideas left, right, and center. And I, I do wonder if it's because he has to reassemble his team, a strategic advisory inside of the company, and that's just going to take a bit of time. We've been asking about the future of ESPN for something like a decade now. Yeah. What is the future of ESPN? I think it's fine for the near term. I think the problem, and I worry about this with sports in general, is that one of the great appeals of sports is that everyone watches a little bit of sports, at least. Then you've got a, sm a large number still of, of hardcore uh, consumers who will pay a lot of money for it. But the business model only works if you get everyone watching a little bit of it, too. The advertising money goes in and really makes the economics work only because of the breadth and the reach. But as we get to a world where the primary way to access sports content will be on your traditional pay TV service, well, most people who don't want sports, don't want to pay for it directly, will not have pay TV services within a few years. And they're not going to pay an a la carte $30 or $40 a month for an ESPN streaming service either. So I think sports is in a really difficult place when you start to look out five years from now. Well, that means that cable companies are in a very bad place when you look out that far. And I am wondering how far are we from the time when streaming takes over the sports uh, channels, the sports teams, the sports viewing, and basically is the death knell Our for the cable. Ca cable's in a great place because they're okay. ultimately a data business. They're internet services businesses. Everything's a data business. No, no, but they really are because you primarily choose your cable operator now because you want the high-speed data service. Oh. You all pay right. up for that. We all do. Brian, it's good to see you. Good Brian Weiser of Madison and Wall. I'm with Brian on the sporting stuff. Sports rights have got so, so expensive, and we've got to this point where they don't really know what to do with them. So you take a football game and you bury it on Peacock, and you hope yeah. that it sticks, and you hope people start signing up. The strategy around sports is not as obvious as it once was, and I'm not sure if the numbers the profits make as much sense as they used to. And that's the reason why some people are saying the new model looks like the old model, which is you bundle it together and you have an offering. Uh, and the question is, who's going to win from that? What I find interesting is so many sports teams are just going direct. They're saying, you know what, we want yeah. our private capital, we want our, um, our intellectual capital, our intellectual property. So, you know what, we're just going to get the profits directly and you can invest in us. The Netflix results coming up a little bit later on this afternoon. Let's take a look at some of the other stories making headlines this morning. Let's catch up with Yahira Hakez with your Bloomberg Brief. Morning, Yahira. Good morning, John. Goldman Sachs Chief Economist Dion Hatzius weighing in on the Fed's path and the state of the U.S. economy. The Fed is on its way to achieving uh, the soft landing. Obviously, no guarantees, but I like what I'm seeing. Hatzius also saying Goldman maintains a base case for a March rate cut, noting it would be consistent with the trajectory of consumer prices alongside Chair Powell's comments that the central bank would like to cut before inflation returns to 
Citigroup says it's cutting bonuses in its investment banking business. The bank is chopping payouts by 15 to 20 percent this year, according to the financial news. The reductions coming after Citi posted an 11 percent decline in deal making fees for 2023. The SEC confirming a hacker hijacked its Twitter account earlier this month and made a fake post about the approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs. The agency saying an unidentified person changed the password after gaining control of an employee's phone number. The fake post caused a brief surge in the price of the world's biggest cryptocurrency. The SEC approved almost a dozen spot Bitcoin ETFs the following day. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Appreciate the update. Up next on the program, China hoping to spark an equity market bounce after a rough start to 2024. We pulled our clients out of China because we just think it's not a place that you can, as a fiduciary, that you can put client capital. That's next on the program. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Here's the price action on the S&P 500. Three days of gains on the S&P, the longest winning streak of the year so far. Another record close at a close yesterday. This morning, totally unchanged. Under surveillance this morning, China hoping to spark an equity market bounce after a rough start to 2024. The sentiment is so bad, I would have to expect that there's an opportunity somewhere. But we pulled our clients out of China because we just think it's not a place that you can, as a fiduciary, that you can put client capital. You think it's uninvestable? Essentially. Uninvestable. Alicia Levine of BMY Mellon Wealth Management speaking to us yesterday. Today, China drawing up a $278 billion rescue package to backstop, Lisa, the country's stock market. And really, if people are wondering what they're trying to achieve, is it just a temporary boost to valuations or something longer term? Kevin Sneeder, who is head of Asia Pacific, ex-Japan for Goldman Sachs, was speaking on Bloomberg Television, and he said the question when you look at this package or any other set of actions is how does it address that? How does it change the sentiment? Does it give people reasons to believe in the future of the economy in a positive way? Part of the challenge is whether the words will be met with action. That's repeatedly been the issue. Uh, John, when we take a look at the different measures, the piecemeal measures that the Chinese authorities have come up with, it doesn't seem like they're convicted to do something that is holistic and give people comfort. It feels like they've been doing this for the best part of 10 years now. Just tweaks to the end. We've joked about the plunge protection team coming together. I remember 2015, 2016, when big funds in China on the mainland were told they couldn't sell. Not short, couldn't sell stocks. That's how long we've been doing this for now. And that's different than some of the other measures that were announced in other uh, capitalistic economies. I'm thinking of the U.S. that were not so wholesale uh, banning activity. Here's the question. Do you see a real commitment to bringing back foreign direct investment by the Chinese authorities? We saw the biggest uh, coalition of Chinese authorities come to Davos since 2017, trying to talk with people. But there was resignation that things aren't going to change materially, that the U.S.-Chinese relationship is fracturing. And with that kind of backdrop, how do people get that confidence that they can get their money out if they put it in? Let's catch up with Andy Curran, the Bloomberg Global Economy Correspondent down in Washington. Andy, your view on this, just what is the strategy here from Chinese authorities? I, th I think it clearly speaks to a new sense of urgency among the authorities. John, you had Premier Li Chiang the other night making the point that they have to respond with forceful measures. That means now the concerns over, over where the stock market has gone is at the very top of government. Worth bearing in mind, we're only three odd weeks away from Chinese New Year. When you consider the retail investor component of the stock market, they don't really want to have another dampener on consumer sentiment ahead of the all-important holiday season. The question, though, is will this mechanism work? You know, Lisa was talking there about 2015. That had some impact over summer months, but when they pulled back from the market, it went back into the sell-off mode. A lot of people are questioning whether this kind of rescue that they're talking about this time around would be nothing more than a sugar hit. It won't change the fundamentals. We know what they are. Property markets in a slump. FDI, foreign investment, is in a slump. Consumer sentiment isn't great. The piecemeal approach hasn't turned things around. And the question is whether or not this stock market intervention will be enough to do that. And what's the goal here? Is this directed at foreign investors or is this uh, really directed at trying to drum up domestic uh, sentiment at a time where people haven't been spending, people haven't been borrowing, people haven't been deploying their cash that they've been hoarding? 
Definitely a little bit of both. And a domestic story, there's no doubt they don't want the stock market uh, in a heap just before the all-important Chinese New Year holidays, as I mentioned there, given the retail investor component. And, of course, we know corporate profits are being squeezed. There's a sense of overall gloom on the Chinese economy. So there is a domestic angle. But it's equally, though, there is a signal to the world here, especially with Premier Li Chiang. He's been touring the world, and you saw him in Western Europe last week, making this point that China's open for business. Come and invest with us. Come and do business. But, of course, when you have this image of the stock market uh, cratering the way that it is. It just adds to the sense of gloom on China. Uninvestable, as your previous guest said. Companies don't want to invest there anymore. So it's, it's just another effort for China to try and turn around that perception, that image towards China at the moment. But as I say, that's not going to fix the real estate story. It's not going to turn around the foreign investment story. It's not going to turn around the consumer sentiment story. Uh, the stock market's only a small part of China's overall economy and financial system anyway. So it's, it's only one piece in an overall jigsaw here. Jan Hatzius gave an interview with our colleagues in Hong Kong, and, uh, and he talked about that Chinese authorities are not willing to use a bazooka when it comes to stimulus to shore up this problem. What would a bazooka even look like? Well, this has been one of the big frustrations, I think, for the rest of the world, looking at the China story. As we all know, China was a big disappointment last year. It was meant to be the post-COVID zero rebound. It didn't happen. But equally, though, the authorities, very, very disciplined, very restrained when it comes to the amount of support they're willing to put into the economy. They are putting money into the economy. They are spending on infrastructure. They are borrowing. They are certainly uh, putting in some support. But it's not, to your point... This idea of bazooka, and this comes from previous downturns in China where we saw massive whole-scale borrowing spending by the government to try and reflate things. But we know what that legacy has been, of course. It's been a legacy of, of in some parts, wasteful products or wasteful projects. Of course, it's been a legacy of debt that China's been nursing now since the global financial crisis. That's why they're so reticent, I think, again, to go back with this sort of all-out fiscal approach. Uh, but nonetheless... Given how negative sentiment continues to be, one would, one would think that the pressure is building on the authorities to do something a bit more meaningful if they do really want to turn the narrative around. And it just feels desperate. It feels desperate to see reports that they'd be willing to go after the profits, the money offshore from state-owned enterprises, and then recycle that back into the equity market. And you mentioned the fiscal space. Just how much fiscal space do they have if they wanted to do something more? Not a lot at the local government level. That's where the real debt stress is. The central government, of course, has room to borrow and spend if they wanted to, John. But as I mentioned earlier, they're being pretty disciplined in what they want to do. They've, they have sometimes made in the past reference mistakes made by the West, in particular with, say, QE, for example. They don't want to go down that path. But as I say to you, you know, we're in now second, maybe even arguably the third year of this downturn in, in China. The authorities won't want that to go on too long. The, on, you only have to look what's happening in China's great strategic rival of the U.S., Stock market's hitting records, economy holding up well. Uh, I would say there's pressure on Chinese authorities to do something more over the months ahead. And I should stress that this, of course, is a package they're considering, according to people familiar with the matter off the back of our reporting. Your best guess would be this package goes through, Ender? I would say some intervention of some kind is likely, John. They've done it in the past. I don't see why they wouldn't do it again. The question remains whether or not that would be enough to turn things around. We'll see. And the Karen, thank you, sir. Down in Washington on the latest. It's a 278 billion dollar trial balloon for ammo to see if this can put a floor under this slump in equity market. And let's see. I mean, the equities are down some 10 percent year to date. This is not yet January over. We heard Alicia Levine basically talking about how during a time when they were growing at six, seven, eight percent a year, they still didn't get anything when you came to international investments in China. So why are you going to do that somehow now when they're actually slowing down? I don't totally understand what the motivation is, what the goal is. Is it to actually get foreign direct investment in? Do they actually want international companies competing in a real way? Or do they just want to uh, even things out so that they don't grow as slowly as some people are projecting? The slump in equity market is a consequence of poor policy. If you're coming in and trying to buy equities using state-owned enterprises' profits offshore and recycling that back into stocks, you're dealing with the symptoms and not the cause. The cause of this is not just the economy, which has slumped and struggled coming out of COVID. It's also the governance issues that Elisa Levine talked about at BMY Mellon. Deal with the causes if you want to see an equity market in the same place where we've got things in America right now. And seizing offshore money to try to support the uh, equity market might have actually the exact Seems opposite. Seems bizarre, right? Right. Well, it's the exact opposite effect because why would any company have confidence that their money is protected and isn't just going to be reclaimed for government purposes? A tell of two markets at the moment. U.S. equities at all-time highs. China struggling to stimulate demand in their domestic equity market. Coming up in the next hour on this program, brilliant lineup for you. Tom Michaud, 
Uh, the CEO of KBW just around a corner, Henrietta Trays of Vader Partners and Megan Robson of BNP Paribas. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Inflation's coming down. The economy is slowing, but in our view, not falling off a cliff. There could be this stickiness to inflation, which, of course, makes the Fed's intended path a bit more trying. If the Fed were to be aggressive in rate cuts, they run the risk of the economy accelerating a bit and therefore inflation accelerating a bit. The fact that the Fed is considering rate cuts does introduce a new tail risk, which is the reacceleration risk. We're chugging along, but we're probably closer to the recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P positive by not even a tenth of 1%. Three days of gains on the S&P 500, the longest winning streak of 2024 so far. And over the last two days, it's been all-time high, Bramo, after all-time high. And initially, it was just the big tech, and that was really driving it. It was basically NVIDIA's rally, and everyone else was living in it. But then suddenly, yesterday, we saw small caps start to pick up. You saw even regional banks start to pick up, which I thought was interesting, especially in light of Bob Diamond's comments that we heard yesterday. The tech earnings coming up a little bit later on this afternoon. We'll talk the financials in just a moment with KBW. The attention, though, from Wall Street to Washington. We're looking over to New Hampshire this morning. Make or break moment for Nikki Haley. She spends so much time in New Hampshire. If she has a chance in this primary race for president, she has to win New Hampshire. But the polls are showing it's going to be the former president. Basically, everyone is just girding for a very long general election between Trump and Biden, and everyone's trying to understand when it will matter and when they have to pay attention. And what we heard from a number of executives, what, October, is when they're going to start to pay attention. But there's going to be a lot of noise, and there's going to be real questions about how different the two candidates will be, given that the policies haven't been all that different, at least in trade and international relations. It's amazing to follow this, that this Republican primary might well be over in 24 hours if you get a similar win for the former president than one we saw about a week ago. Because it's something that we haven't seen. It's basically an incumbent running in a primary race. How do you beat an incumbent in your own party to take over the gavel to be leader. It's pretty impossible. It's going to be really fun. We're all really looking forward to it. <laughs> Everyone believes I am. You. Everyone believes <laughs> well, you. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just the truth. Everyone comes in and they're like, really? I mean, at a certain point, how do we game this out in terms of potential surprises? Libby Cantrell, I love her comment from Pimco. She wrote in a note, no, Jamie Dimon is not going to be president. No, Oprah Winfrey is not going to be a president. And I asked her, I said, really, why did you put that in as a joke? And she said, literally, the clients that she speaks to are saying to her, come on, isn't it really going to be Jamie Dimon? And she Laurie said, Calvacina, no. RBC, I think nailed it at the start of the year. She said that talking to clients about the political election this year was like staring at the sun. It's like staring at the sun. That's what it felt like for both clients and strategists alike. So we have a lot of fun, a lot of staring, staring into the sun. Staring at the sun for the next 11 months yeah. or something <laughs> Super like exciting. that. Super, sounds dangerous. Let's turn to the price action on the S&P 500, totally unchanged in the bond market. Yields look like this on a 10-year. Lisa, higher by two or three basis points, 413.20. Walking back, rate cuts, uh, hopes and dreams as people start to look out at better than expected data. One data point after another being better than expected. Curious to see on Friday, PCE, personal spending and income, could that really change the dial or are people basically kind of leaning into June as the rate cut and everything else will follow? So far, so good. The data's been good. Doesn't scream March cut, but we heard from Goldman, maybe March rate cut. We heard from Bank of America, maybe March rate cut. That data's got to turn at some point, though, surely. Well, here's the frustration that a lot of people have. You're getting better than expected data, but ongoing disinflation. When do we see inflation respond to the fact that we're seeing better than expected economic uh, activity or are we still living in the post-pandemic uh, reassessment of uh, prices? Stocks just about unchanged on the S&P 500. Coming up on the program, we'll talk about the all-time highs in the United States and then China, just a massive struggle considering a rescue package to try and stimulate demand, not in the economy, but for Chinese stocks. Then later on, we'll talk United Airlines, the stock flying high on better than expected earnings and some pushback against Boeing. Then, of course, we'll wrap things up through the air with a conversation about Nikki Haley and Donald Trump clashing 
in New Hampshire. We begin with our top story. Stocks at record highs. The bank's helping to fuel the rally on the heels of a strong fourth quarter. KPW announcing its top picks for 2024, writing this. We like Goldman, Morgan Stanley, given the backdrop is becoming more favorable for capital markets due to declining pressures on interest rates. A prolonged period of time with recession level investment banking activity and the potential for the Basel III end game to be meaningfully watered down. I'm really pleased to say that with us for the hour, Tom Michaud, the KBW CEO is with us for the next 60 minutes or so. Tom, good morning. Good morning. Great to be with Let's you. Let's get straight into earnings. You've talked about it from three perspectives, the industry, the economy, yeah. and ultimately going forward from here for the stocks as well. Walk us through the three. Yeah, I think the industry is a lot like what's been happening across corporate America, which is it's all centered around the COVID and the COVID policy and the policies to defeat COVID. So the hangover for the banking industry was we had a five and a quarter percent interest rate move in 16 months, which is the most in 40 years. And also, what I, just to remind you, is deposits typically grow 5% a year. They grew 38% in the early days of COVID. So the industry is dealing with the unwinding of all this. That means that the industry has had negative operating leverage since its balance sheets have been resetting. There's been no revenue growth in the banking industry. That is going to change, we believe, in June. We believe that we will finally reset the balance sheets. We'll be moving forward if the Fed does, in fact, cut rates. We've got two, two cuts in our model for the second half of the year. So, so that will be the first thing. The second thing is we just had earnings report, reports out. And I, the stocks rallied 35% from the end of October into the end of the year. The reason for that was it took the worst case off the table. A lot of investors still felt like the worst case scenario was possible. There were lots of questions I was getting from clients about, is this the global financial crisis again? I think we've demonstrated it's not that. And so, so the industry has survived, is about to re-engage and start to grow again, which we think will start in June. And then the other thing is you talked about the stocks. A lot of talk about how stocks are in the high teens P.E. ratio and are expensive. Well, not banks and not a lot of small cap banks, that's for sure. They typically trade around nine times earnings. Some of them have very big dividend yields that they're going to increase. Most of these companies will be buying back stock by the end of the year. And so really, if you were to summarize what we're talking to clients about, 2024 exit velocity. That is a theme that's being talked about a lot, which is we think we'll have an industry that's growing revenues again slowly. We'll have banks that are raising dividends. We'll have buybacks coming. And if we get a soft landing, that is the Goldilocks scenario. And then we could talk a little bit about credit quality because that's what derails it all. It shows how low the bar is when it's basically not the financial crisis. Let's go. I'm curious, <laughs> though, when you're talking about uh, the potential to restart and that there isn't a crisis anymore. During March, people were talking about the fact that the FDIC was not insuring beyond a certain level at these small banks, and that became a huge liability. Why wouldn't, in the sign of any distress whatsoever, every investor pull their money as quickly as possible, even faster next time around, to get ahead of any kind of issue? Until that's solved, isn't there basically a cloud hanging over you, regionals? That is a great question and a great setup. I couldn't agree more. I testified in front of Congress last May on that very topic, and, and I agree. Um, you don't want America to pick the, the, their bank based on its size. The implicit guarantee that's been put into these big banks is extraordinary. In an eight-day span of last March, Silicon Valley Bank failed, and the FDIC said the depositors don't get their money back on Friday. They didn't change their mind till Sunday. When Credit Suisse in Europe got in trouble, which was a global SIFI, in the middle of the night on the weekend, the central bank organized a merger with their 100-year competitor across the street, and no depositor was at risk. If you want to see the difference of the implicit guarantee, look at those eight days and how the two different banks were treated. So the fact of the matter is, small business in America is going to be very unhappy that the FDIC and Congress have not created a modernization of the FDIC insurance fund where small businesses feel comfortable leaving their deposits in banks. And meanwhile, the, the proposals that we have seen are all about capital and all about issues that had nothing to do with the three bank failures. So, the reason, so we're not addressing the key issue, which is deposit insurance modernization. So let's and talk you about said it very well, Lisa. Let's talk about the consequences. We're focusing on the wrong thing. What are the consequences going to be if we go forward with this? 
Well, well, there will be another crisis because it, you know, one of the things I did, I wish I didn't have to do, is I've been reading about bank failures in the United States in the creation of the FDIC. You can actually listen <laughs> to FDR's speech uh, encouraging passage of the FDIC on their website. So if you want to hear it in his words, you can go listen to it. Every 15 years, America has had a banking crisis. It's not unusual, and it's because that's the role banks take. And what you need is you need the deposit insurance fund to make it orderly so there's not a panic. And, and what we learned in the recent crisis is money moves faster than ever before. If you read the testimony of Greg Becker in front of the Senate, what you'll see is essentially 85% of his deposits fled in 48 hours. There's probably no bank in the world who can survive that without some sense of liquidity. This is what the FDIC was built for. They should modernize the insurance fund and they should protect mid-sized banks so small businesses can leave their money in the small bank. By the way, if a small business puts their money in one of these big banks, the deposit goes to the big bank and gets lent somewhere else. You leave a money in a regional bank, it probably gets lent in that neighborhood and in that region. So the policy response did not match the failure in your opinion. Why? Yes. Um, what I hear is there are an equal number of Republicans and Democrats that don't favor it because they believe that it will create a moral hazard for the banks and it'll be a license to go create, to create another, another chaotic moment. Three banks failed spectacularly last year because they didn't get it right. 4,700 didn't. Okay, most of the industry got it right and there actually are some common themes to the three that failed. So, so realistically, the industry can handle it if you supervise it right. So if it's done right, and I think the economy is going to need it, because if what happens is these mid-sized banks believe they need to be part of a bigger bank to offset the implicit guarantee, and this happens over a long period of time, then you're going to lose the small business lenders, and suddenly you'll have a bigger credit uh, crunch possibly in the United States when times get tough. So putting regulation aside, I'm looking out to your idea that we're going to see growth, profit growth in June, that we're going to see this sort of bottoming out and then people are going to start uh, seeing these banks earn money. From where? Because we saw auto lending basically fall off a cliff. We saw mortgages having a real tough time. We've already seen that market basically die. And meanwhile, we have the issue of all of these private capital providers that are coming into your space. I mean, how much can you really see that growth? I think you just listed the agenda of a typical bank board meeting. <laughs> like those are <laughs> like thrilling. all the things that like <laughs> when I go to a bank board that we talk about, like, have you seen our board books? And that was pretty good. So the reality is yes, yes, and yes, which is, you know, we're doing something we've never done, which is unwinding massive support post pandemic. And it's kind of messed with everything. So nothing's happening like it normally does. The industry essentially ran out of deposits because of all this COVID money and, the, and deposits had been shrinking. Loan to deposits is the key ratio in the industry. If the banks don't have liquid access, because the banks are competing with treasuries. I, I heard Bill Gross's interview with you earlier today. Um, take a 5% T-bill, that's a pretty good return rather than putting it in the bank. So that's not giving the banks the fuel to make loans. That will correct itself and we think it will by the end of the year. Um, also, as the economy starts to look better, banks will get more eager about lending. It's all about a reset moment. And I think it hap we think it happens, but it happens very slowly. But like you said earlier too, Lisa, which is all we need is, is non-chaos for these stocks to go up because there's been so much bad news in them. My favorite stat of yours, just to stand out, the bank in 2008 of the top 10 mortgage originators, eight were banks, and now that number's three. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. The change we've and, seen? And, and, you know, so we're talking about like this Basel endgame. Don't think for a second that these rules don't have major implications. And here's the real problem is that the regulators, regulate, regulatory proposals are to de-risk the banking system. The business is still going to get done. It's just going to get done in an unregulated place, which I can't believe we're better off with. We get a lot of talk about what we don't want, but we don't get a lot of talk about what we do want, which is we have the greatest financial system in the world. Why are we playing so why are we changing it so much without an end game policy? But to get to your point, in 2008, eight of the top 10 banks, eight of the top 10 mortgage originators in America were banks. Today, it's three. Banks only make 25% of the mortgages in America today. And that's happened because of regulation. And that's why, I'll even throw another curveball sure. at you on this Basel endgame. 
for all of us who read about the global financial crisis, one night, all the biggest investment banks in America became banks. Now, we're gonna get a capital charge on investment banking activity. They're gonna trying to push investment banking activity out of banks after they were all required to become banks. We're gonna do the full circle, and by the way, Investment banking is still going to get done in the United States. It just won't be in a regulated entity like a bank. You just need to stare down the barrel of the camera and address the senator from Massachusetts <laughs> I directly. Think, in I future. think he is. All right, Tom. <laughs> Tom's show, KVW, is going to stick with us. Tom, it's good to see you. Time now for a look at some of the other stories making headlines this morning. Let's catch up with the Hira Hackers with your Bloomberg brief. Morning, Yahira. Good morning, John. New Hampshire heads to the polls in the nation's first primary. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley vying for the GOP nomination. The first batch of results coming from the small town of Dixville Notch, with all six votes going to Haley. Israel says 24 soldiers were killed on Monday after an attack on a tank and explosions at nearby buildings. This marks the worst single-day death toll since its war against Hamas began in October. Israeli forces are advancing deeper into the southern and central parts of Gaza while facing mounting pressures to wind down the fighting. Eurozone credit demand is bottoming out, according to the ECB's latest bank lending survey. Demand has been falling for more than a year on the back of rising interest rates and a struggling economy. The survey shows that the drop in appetites for business and consumer loans was smaller in the fourth quarter than in the previous three months of last year. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on the program, a pivotal day in the Republican presidential race. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That is nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to do that is if we elect a new generational conservative leader. That's next on the program. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. ECB decide to cut rates. We are on the right path, but I'm not going to shout victory. Bloomberg Television brings you the breaking news and detailed analysis after ECB President Christine Lagarde's press conference. The wages issue is what I think the ECB is really focused on. June is our base case. There is still a 50-50 chance of, of a rate cut coming just slightly before that. In many ways, they should have been cutting already early to stimulate growth. The ECB decides Thursday on Bloomberg Television. Three days of gains on the S&P 500, the longest daily winning streak of the year so far. The year is young, but the three-day winning streak is it at the moment. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about positive by 0.03%. Yields are higher by two basis points, 4.12.82 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, a pivotal day in the Republican presidential race. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to do that is if we elect a new generational conservative leader. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. Chaos follows him. Here's the latest this morning. Nikki Haley making her final pitch to voters ahead of today's New Hampshire primary. The Republican field down to just two candidates and the former president holding a clear lead over the last remaining challenger. MH, it's down to two. Yep, it sets up another Trump-Biden rematch. That's what we hear from Greg Vallier this morning of AGF Investments. He says the theme in recent days has been who has the better or worse cognitive skills, but that's a losing issue for both candidates. But a better economy with data to support that improvement is a big deal. This looks like a Goldilocks economy. And if Americans finally begin to believe that, Joe Biden has a decent chance of winning re-election. John, it's that topic we keep talking about. Is the timeline on Biden's side? Is the calendar on his side? We start to see consumer confidence pick up. We saw that in you, Mitch, on Friday. Jobless claims are south of 200K. There's a pitch here to make. The problem is it hasn't resonated at all over the last 12 months. You wonder if it ever will. Joining us now is Henrietta Trace, the Economic Policy Research Director at Vader Partners. Henrietta, let's get straight into it. Your line, even if Nikki Haley wins New Hampshire, we see no path to her becoming the nominee. Why is that? Um, you know, we're basically just looking ahead. Nevada and South Carolina, the former governor's home state, are going so hard for Trump. 
that she doesn't have a path forward beyond this. What Republican voters have been telling pollsters all year long is that they want Trump. Uh, the way I put it in my notice, nobody wants Diet Coke. They don't want all Coke alternative. They want the real thing. And they can have the real thing if they just pull the lever for him. And that's what I expect they'll do in New Hampshire, where he's polling up by at least 20 points in the data that came out this morning. Um, and then looking forward to Nevada and South Carolina. And then on a Super Tuesday, there is no inroad for another candidate. So I think believe the voters when they say that they want Donald Trump. That's what Republicans are telling them time and again. That's how they voted in Iowa overwhelmingly. Um, and that's what I suspect is the run path here going forward. So if you have this rematch of Biden and Trump, where does it leave the independent voters, which many of them went for Biden last round? Do they still go for him this round? That's the key question. Uh, that's the whole ballgame. 56% of those voters went for Biden in 2020, and the fight should be on for exactly those folks. It's about 28% of the population uh, spread nationwide. It only matters in a handful of states. So we'll be watching those very carefully. It's the same ones that you would suspect, Wisconsin, Michigan, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia. Um, although I do think that this year there's uh, less likelihood that Democrats win Georgia. Um, you know, Stacey Abrams had an incredible turnout machine back in the Senate races and in the 2020 election really need to turn that on. I would encourage folks to watch Jim Clyburn, who is getting much more aggressive. Um, and he, of course, is integral to Vice, uh, uh, Vice President Biden becoming the presidential nominee and for Kamala Harris to become the VP. Those are two really important people to watch as they head into South Carolina, North Carolina and Georgia uh, in the general election cycle. Since you mentioned Biden in South Carolina, can we talk about Biden being missing today on the New Hampshire primary ballot? Is this potentially going to be an embarrassment for him? I don't think so. And I mean, no disrespect to the lovely people of New Hampshire, but they are not indicative of the state of national politics the way that they used to be. So just as dismissive as I am about a potential Haley, you know, coming in five, 10 points shy instead of a 20 point blowout. Um, I feel the same way about Biden. He's not on the ballot. I don't think there's any confusion about the state. He won by eight points, if I'm not mistaken, in 2020. Um, you know, the Democratic Party is shifting gears into a more representative and diverse uh, primary election. And this is the first year where they're doing that. So there's some anomaly here, but I don't think that it is an arbiter of things to come. Henriette, I can feel the exasperation in some of these notes when you get these sort of people saying, what are the possibilities of anyone else coming into the race? You say the only way either Biden or Trump is not the nominee is if some sort of black swan event occurs before the convention and party leadership decides it is time or necessary to go in another direction. Henrietta, given the fact that it's probably most likely, almost certainly a Trump-Biden matchup, from a policy perspective, what are you focused most on, both from the candidates and from the voters, uh, with respect to understanding what a post-election period looks like? This is the core thing I can't wait for people to sort of migrate to. We have a $2.7 trillion tax bill that has to be written in 2025. The potential for minutia on the corporate tax side pertaining to tech and pharma companies, um, to international trade, international taxation, um, domestic cap gains and dividends taxes. Those are, you know, the bread and butter of what I love to do. So I can't wait to get into that conversation. But to be really honest, the most striking part that investors are actually focused on at this point um, is the potential for a universal baseline tariff. For those of you who remember the 2016 efforts from Paul Ryan to impose a border adjustment tax, you know, it's time to dust off those old books. The universal baseline tariff is what investors get most keyed into. Um, and they do not take Trump lightly when he says he would impose a 10 percent tariff on all imports. It is the primary revenue raiser in his tax plan. And as I mentioned at the outset, you must have a tax bill in 2025. All of the individual tax rates expire. Both Biden and Trump would extend them. It's just a matter of scale and scope and probably duration. And then, of course, the offset. How do you want to pay for that? Do you want a universal baseline tariff to pay for it? If so, Trump is your guy. Uh, most people are taking that incredibly seriously uh, versus the last time around when they assumed that the tariffs were something that he talked about but never intended on doing. Mexico, the EU, uh, Japan, China, there is no difference between allies and foes in these tariffs being proposed by the, by, uh, the Trump campaign. So um, I think a lot of folks, as we key into policy as opposed to just vibes, uh, we'll start to think about both tax and trade uh, as the primary outcomes yeah. of this election. Well said. Henrietta Trace there, Aveda Partners. What was that? Policy, not vibes. Yeah.
Probably seen on fives. Well, you know, we're still in the vibe, I think. Sure. Which is the reason why we're talking about Coming up on the program, United okay. shares rising in the pre-market following better than estimated earnings. That conversation up next. Three days of gains on the S&P 500. Equities look like this this morning. Struggling to make it day four, just about unchanged on the S&P on the Nasdaq, positive by 0.07%. The longest daily winning streak of the year so far. Two record highs, two consecutive all-time highs on the S&P 500. In the bond market, the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year shaping up as follows. A two-year in and around 440, 441 on a two-year. We've had pushback after pushback from Fed officials against the idea that we get an early cut. And yet Goldman are talking about the potential for one and Bank of America too. Yeah, you are seeing a bit of a repricing in Fed funds futures where you can see about a 40% chance priced in of a March rate cut. But does it really matter if it's March or if it's June, if it's March or May or June? I mean, honestly, at a certain point, I've been reading all of these notes where it doesn't ultimately matter if they start cutting rates and if they're doing so at a time where there's otherwise strong growth. So that, I think, is the bigger question right now. The Thomas Show of KBW alongside is sort of, sort of nodding, nodding yeah, as Bremo talks. Direction direction. That, that is the key. And I think it's unanimous that everyone believes that the next move by the Fed is a cut, which means people can start planning for that. Because the, the relentless increases was disorderly. Now we get something that's more orderly. Um, and then so businesses can plan for that. And the cuts are good for the banks now? They are. They are because it'll decrease the competition that U.S. Treasuries are giving them for the deposits in an inverted yield curve. Isn't that a big change that's from what we used to talk about? Y yes, because banks are typically asset sensitive, which means they do better when rates rise. But banks, banks don't do well when things are disorderly. And five and a quarter points in 16 months, is I would define that as disorderly. If things were certainly disorderly at times last year, that's for sure. The yes. two-year at the moment, 441, yields up by, let's call it two basis points. I want to finish on foreign exchange. In the FX market, the euro against the dollar looks like this, negative by 0.2%, 108. 64. Under Savannah's this morning, voters heading to the polls in New Hampshire facing a choice between Nikki Haley and Donald Trump. The two remaining GOP candidates intensifying their attacks on each other in the lead up to the first nation's first primary. Haley saying the U.S. quote, can't survive another four years of Trump while the former president already looking ahead to a November matchup with Joe Biden. It's amazing how this primary has started and ultimately might finish in the next 24 hours. Potentially going to finish very shortly. Uh, I am astonished by how much money was just spent in New Hampshire alone, more than $75 million. It has 873,000 registered voters. That's a ton of money in a tiny state. Nikki Haley has spent a lot of money and time there, and it looks like the former president is going to win it. I wish that you could just go to one of these small states, they just mail a check. I mean, at a certain point, isn't that sort of, wouldn't that be more effective than trying to advertise in all of these ways when so many people have already made up their minds? Just saying, you know, not that I live in one. You want to make it easier. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I don't know. I feel like these are such a... You want to make it more transparent. Exactly. It's such a sort of a small referendums, and it, it basically is becoming clear. We know what the outcome is going to be. When can we move on to policy? Right now, we can talk about policy. It's about policy and not vibes. Henrietta Trey's of Vader Partners about five or ten minutes ago. Tom, how do you think about things? The prospect of maybe having a completely different regulatory backdrop with a Trump presidency in 12 months' time. Yeah, I think it's very important because um, the president gets to build out his team who executes from the uh, executive office. And, and you've seen a lot of approaches, and I'll speak to the area of my bailiwick, like we are talking about this, these Basel III endgame rules. Remember. Basel is an effort of global regulators to have globally systemic banks have a common-ish type set of rules. Um, the United States just elected to gold plate theirs and come in, according to J.P. Morgan and others, 30 percent higher than the rest of the world. Um, that was a very aggressive step. And, and I would argue that it's not as much about de-risking the banks as it is trying to really transform what the industry looks like. That's a pretty assertive step to take, and that's the debate that's going on. And so those types of decisions get made by, uh, by the president's team. Big 12 months ahead. I want to turn to this story. The U.S. and U.K. Are launching more attacks on Yemen's Houthi rebels in the latest efforts to stop the group targeting ships in the Red Sea. It's the eighth round of allied attacks since January 12. The ongoing tension causing a spike in shipping costs. AMH, China to Europe rates up almost 400% 
over the past three months. That's right. And you're going to see ships continue to avoid the Red Sea, continues to avoid the Gulf of Aden until they actually have this under control. What we continuously see from this administration is they want to degrade Houthis' capabilities, but at the same time make sure there's no civilian casualties. What did Biden say himself this weekend? Is it going to stop the Houthis? No. But potentially gives them a little bit less ammunition based off where they are targeting and some of the ammunition they're trying to take out. Let's talk about the economic fallout, never mind shipping rates. How close are we to seeing goods inflation start to pick up again? I've gotten so much pushback over the past couple of days, I've got Why? to be honest. People saying, yeah, you're basically overplaying this. It's not going to cause massive inflation. You're not already seeing it. It's only going to be a European problem, which is the reason why the U.S. isn't necessarily going to come out with more uh, sort of protracted efforts to stop this. I don't know. I'm curious, and I keep pushing back and saying uh, I think it could be an issue. I've heard the opposite, where an analyst said to me, it is affecting someone's bottom line at this exact moment. Maybe we're not seeing it as big as, say, when all the ports had those huge you know, pile-ups, but at this point, it is hitting someone's bottom line. The amount of money and fuel now it takes to go around Africa is a big deal. Not just I, the Suez Canal, but Panama as well at the same I, time. I, I would just say, if you were to think our, mac our macro risks in general, high or low, they're high. And so you could just add this to one to another reason. I think it just leads to a little bit of caution amongst the business community and investors. Tom, this story's for you. City cutting its bonuses in its investment banking division by as much as 20 percent, according to a report by Financial News. It's the latest move in a major organizational overhaul at the bank, with 20,000 jobs set to be eliminated over the medium term. Bonus season on Wall Street. How good or bad is it? Uh, it look. Typically, Wall Street is a pay for performance business and, and investment banking. I know no one's crying for investment bankers, but has essentially <laughs> been in a recession for the last year. So it, it, compensation typically follows revenue. So as a, on a percentage change basis, it shouldn't be surprising. One of the things I read in one of the stories, though, is that I heard is that a lot of the producers will get paid more than management. I would actually applaud them for that. Um, that that's actually, I think, a good step if that's happening. I just wonder who the performers are. Are they in the tech wing or are they on the trading floor or on the banking floor? I mean, at a certain point, where is the outperformance going to come from as we see kind of banks shifting their models in a significant way? Well, what I, what I will tell you is that there's tremendous pent up demand for investment banking services. All this time that there have been no IPOs and mergers have been slow, there's a lot of pent up demand. And also, five or six years ago, we started the boom of private equity. There are a tremendous number of companies in private equity portfolios that are seasoning that need to be dealt with. Um, there is, and, and my experience, I've been on Wall Street for 38 years. My experience is when it turns, it's not just a little bit. It usually turns a lot. And so once the market's open, you'll start to see a lot more activity. And I think cities probably like a lot of other firms, which is that you have to think is what we're seeing now the new normal? Um, I personally don't believe so. I think we will see when, when we get stability and orderliness, like we've talked about before, there's a lot of business to be done. And I think a lot of price levels will have reset, which will allow things like mergers and, and IPOs to happen. You're constructive about the end of this year. I will just say this about City. Getting paid in City stock has been like getting a bonus cut every year for a long, long time. That has not been a good thing, Bramo. Except for right after 2008 and 2009, it was actually a really good thing briefly for a hot second. But you're right. So it raises this question, how do you then even the playing field and attract talent in another way? And one thing I will say is uh, we talked earlier about how big seems in times of crisis to be a safer place to put your money. Big hasn't necessarily been the best investment or they're not necessarily the, the, the highest performing companies. So like we, there are great small banks. And there are banks that are really big that have challenges. So it's, it's, it's so size isn't a determinant of success. Um, it might be a determinant of depositor confidence, but not of success. That was the story last year, that's for sure. Let's turn to earnings from United Airlines. The shares flying high in the pre-market after the company reported better than estimated results. The company also posting a strong profit outlook for the year. Despite uncertainty remaining over the status of its Boeing MAX 9 jets, Brooke Sutherland of Bloomberg Opinion joins us now for more. Brooke, how are they getting this done with so many planes still on the ground? I mean, I think their forecast for the first quarter is not great. Um, I mean, that is a seasonally weak period for airlines, and it's been one that's particularly difficult for them to navigate in this post-pandemic period where you do not have that business traveler coming back in the way that they have historically. Um, so they're looking for sort of a sharp 
turnaround um, in the second part of the year. And I think a lot of that is international travel and the sort of continued trend of um, travelers gravitating toward more premium options. Uh, the legacy carriers like United have really benefited in this market, whereas the low cost carriers have struggled. If they cannot get their MAX 9 jets back online, if they can't remedy some of these issues that they've complained about or Scott Kirby reportedly has, does that materially affect their outlook? Does that really hit their stock yet again, given that they had such uncertainty baked into their forecast? I think you're going to see higher maintenance expenses. I mean, that's the knock-on effect for some of these airlines. Delta, when it reported earnings um, earlier this month, was talking about $350 million of extra maintenance expenses this year, just relative to last year, which was by no means cheap as far as aircraft maintenance. And it's not just the MAX 9. Remember, you also have RTX, which is doing a very costly recall of its GTF jet engine that powers the Airbus uh, A320 jets. So you're talking about significant chunks of the aviation fleet potentially being grounded um, over the course of 2024. What that means for the airlines is that they have to keep flying older planes for longer or they have to use bigger airplanes for markets that don't necessarily need that many seats. That all has a cost to it. Just on a related point, uh, GE came out and it disappointed right ahead of their big uh, break off and you're seeing GE shares tank. What's going on in the industrial complex in the U.S. or is that just too broad of a question? Is this uh, really a Boeing pr a problem? Is this a GE problem? Is there something that's hampering these companies so that they can't get it done? I think with GE, so this stock has really taken off like a rocket ship um, ahead of its breakup. I think people are excited about the possibility of having a simplified GE at long last. This is also a company that under Larry Culp has had a tendency to be very conservative with its guidance. Um, and so I think we need a little bit more details there, but I don't know if that's necessarily sort of a macro impact. On the other hand, you did have 3M out this morning calling for flat to up 2% organic growth. That is not heroic. That is not um, something that's really going to get investors excited, particularly coming off of a 2023 that was very weak for short cycle industrial companies like 3M, those companies that have sort of the quicker turnaround times. They've really been struggling with this period of inventory destocking that we've seen. You had manufacturers build up a huge amount of inventory during the supply chain disruptions, and now they're working that down and you're seeing orders start to slow. Um, and we really haven't seen kind of the boom uh, to the bottom line from any of these phenomenons that we keep talking about, whether it's reshoring, electrification, automation. It's just not necessarily showing up in a major way just yet in bottom lines. Now, analysts are optimistic that might happen in the second half of 2024, but we'll see if we end up getting that. Brooke, just want to finish where we started, which is on Boeing and United. On Boeing specifically, how do you expect this to end? From the people you speak to, what's the base case right now? I think you have to look at management, and I think you have to wonder how much longer um, you can keep the current management in place, just given the series of crises that Boeing has dealt with, um, big and small. Uh, of course, you know, from the grounding of the MAX to then just having sort of quality control issues come up before this latest one involving the door plugs. There was improperly drilled fastener holes. There was incorrectly installed rear fittings on the MAX. And I think you have to wonder if maybe it's time for a deeper rooted cultural change. We were talking about GE. That is a company that has really gone top to bottom and sort of reworking the way that that business is run. And I think you need a similar change at Boeing, and that might have to come from somebody with more outside perspective. Hey, Brooke, thank you. Brooke Sutherland there of Bloomberg Opinion. Bramo, the second time that's come up with Brooke, the cultural issues inside the company. I mean, you can't avoid it right now because it's been a series of things, right? In 2019, there was this issue, and now it's just one hit after another. I mean, it's just uh, the fact that they have to examine these plugs in different uh, in different models. The fact that we saw a burning plane flying over Miami. This isn't helping it's kind the of reputation. Shocking, right? yeah, it is. I mean, this is not what you want to see. Do you think there's a risk here? Perception, not reality, but perception that the regulator starts to be perceived as being a soft touch on a company like Boeing because it's a national champion. There is that issue. There's also an issue of, you know, who are they getting to inspect some of these and what kind of turnover are they seeing, especially post pandemic? We hear this again and again, staffing issues post-COVID that have become really problematic and have created some liabilities in a number of industrial companies. So at what point will that really kind of shake out and normalize? Huge, huge issue. Time now for some stories elsewhere making headlines this morning. Let's get you an update with Yahari Hackers from Bloomberg Brief. Hey, Yahara. Beijing is considering a stock rescue package to stabilize its slumping market. Bloomberg learning that authorities are seeking to mobilize about $278 billion from offshore accounts of Chinese state-owned enterprises. That would be used to buy shares onshore through, through the Hong Kong exchange link. 
The plan, however, is met with skepticism, with investors expecting any stock rebound to prove fleeting without a fundamental fix. Netflix has bought the exclusive rights to the world wrestling entertainment show Raw. It's the streaming giant's first big move into live events. Raw will air on Netflix beginning in January 2025. Harvard University is beefing up its legal team for two probes brought by the House Education and the Workforce Committee, according to people familiar with the matter. The investigations focus on anti-Semitism on campus, as well as Harvard's handling of plagiarism allegations against former president Claudine Gay. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yeah, Hira, thank you. Up next on the program, the credit market gets the boost. These are, you know, banks that wouldn't have been able to issue uh, last spring um, and you wouldn't have been able to sell, sell the paper even if you tried. And uh, now they're issuing with little concession. That's next. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Stocks on the S&P 500 look like this, totally unchanged after closing yesterday at another all-time high. Under surveillance this morning, a strong start to the year for the credit market. We've had a, a tremendous few weeks uh, in investment grade credit. Uh, for example, I think just to speak to the amount of the way that sentiment has shifted over the last 12 months, you think about the regional banks and the issuance that they've done over the past week. Um, these are you know, banks that wouldn't have been able to issue uh, last spring um, and you wouldn't have been able to sell, sell the paper even if you tried. And uh, now they're issuing with little concession and um, you know, multiple times oversubscribed on the books. So it's been a really large sentiment shift and I, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Elisa, what a start to the year for credit. And if you hear the pile on, I mean, it's coming from every corner of Wall Street. Not only the issuer is seeing a good time to uh, issue, the fastest pace of issuance in, I think, decades, but the buyers as well. Andrew Sheets, uh, global head of corporate credit research over at Morgan Stanley, writing in a note, quote, we don't see credit as sensitive to whether the Fed starts easing in March or June if the longer term path is clear. In other words, rate cuts. Overall, balance sheet health looks solid with plenty of dispersion. So here's the question, John. Is there anything that could crack that solidness in a soft landing situation, even if the Fed doesn't cut as much as people expect, credit a lot of people see as potentially outperforming? Let's ask Megan Robson, the head of U.S. credit strategy over at BNP Paribas. Morning, Megan. Good morning. What a start to the year, January. Can we just start with the supply? What's the demand been like? Incredible, incredible demand for, for the issuance we've seen. So, as you said, high-grade issuance, one of the top, top um, levels we've seen on record. And it's amazing to see IG spreads have actually tightened as we've seen all of that issuance. So we think some of it is corporates pulling forward issuance from uh, later this year uh, to now, given the strong demand. In the case of financials, we've also seen uh, regionals take advantage of this environment, diversifying away from kind of de their deposit base and, and, and locking in some long-term funding. That's what I wanted to get to. Are they pulling forward this year's supply or are they catching up with last year because they couldn't issue? It's a great question. So if you look at long-term debt growth for investment grade, it's still very muted. We're still at 1% growth. So this isn't a huge boost in issuance overall in terms of the long-term trend. So I think there are some issuers that are catching up, but there's also high-grade issuers that we've talked to that you know, we're contemplating issuing in third or fourth quarter and are just taking advantage of this demand. Investors are thinking this could be the last time they have this opportunity to lock in yields uh, and investments at these levels. And, and so that's why we've seen so many deals oversubscribed. Some people, some skeptical people could say, if they're issuing now to get ahead of something that is less favorable, that means that yields are gonna rise or that spreads are gonna rise. And yet nobody seems to be calling for that, certainly not on the investment side. So can you kind of bridge that gap? Well, I think there's we're, we're pricing in this high for shorter environment, as as you said, which which should benefit the refinancing risk, I think. But the open question, which uh, is still very debatable, is if these lower quality issuers are going to be able to refinance later this year. So well, we've seen a lot of of high grade issuance, higher quality issuers refinance. But for triple C's, you still have 25, 30 issuers that need to refi this year for them. 
the refinancing penalty is still 400, 500 basis points. Um, so that, that, is, that is a major risk for the credit market still. We have Thomas showed here, the head of KBW, nodding vigorously to what you're saying. What could go wrong? I mean, basically, given that everyone seems to be seeing this sweet spot in credit. Well, it's interesting because right now the consensus is pretty strong. So you have a lot of believers in the, in, in the soft landing. Um, the, the risks that we identify and, and it, uh, is around credit quality. Um, we are forecasting a 25% increase in credit costs for the banking industry for this year, but that is still below what's normal. So you could argue that the banks are still over earning on credit. When credit costs go up, it shouldn't be a surprise. The surprise is for how long it's been so low. But yet when we do our channel checks and when we look at the recent quarter earnings, yeah, non-performers are up a little bit, but they're one-offs. Credit quality is still excellent, I would say, in the banking industry, and there's nothing on the horizon that's making us nervous about it. Um, but you've got some big issues. Now, commercial real estate is a big issue, but we think it's primarily specific to the big cities and the big properties. And we also believe that non-banks have at least half of that exposure. It's not all banks that have that exposure. And Megan, would you agree with that? So I think we were surprised in, in the financials earnings to see how, uh, how positive the credit picture was for financials. So CRE losses uh, increased a bit, but, but overall uh, very muted. And so I think CRE remains a, an overhang, but very slow moving train. And uh, so the, the positive credit reporting on financials was definitely, uh, I think, supportive and, and has helped demand for for many of these deals. Megan. And, and, and I would say from a bigger picture, by pardon me, is it just means the worst case scenario is further off the table. And it makes people feel more comfortable that we're in a more orderly, typical market because um, we're seeing no directional changes that said, hey, some of those risks everybody was worried about last year are happening. We're actually getting further from that rather than closer. Megan, if people had said maybe five years ago, six years ago, that rates would be at this level and that a lot of these high yield companies that had borrowed at zero were going to come and have to survive, people would have said this is going to be Armageddon. You'd have incredible mass defaults. Does it ever surprise you? that we're here and people are talking about the sanguine environment where everything's going to be fine and companies are going to be able to survive at these levels. I think it's it's very it's very surprising to us it has been. I think the the liquidity backdrop has been very very supportive. That's that's one factor and then I think look at the data. It's it continues to surprise to the upside, consumer sentiment, retail sales last week. I think um, if we start to see earnings growth and EBITDA start to really be more challenged this year, then I think that could uh, that could really bring that risk back into the in, into the discussion. And, and what I would say is I think that the forward market's going to favor companies with earnings. And you saw it in the stock market. And you're going to see it, I think, in the credit market would be our my perspective and our perspective. And also, as we get orderly, those companies that might have that trouble that you were alluding to, if we get an M&A market, they'll sell before they'll have to refi their debt. Now, when, when there's a crisis, you can't even do that. But, but if we get stability, they will take actions to correct before they have to go to market with a tough deal. Megan, just final question. Favorite trade for 2024. What is it now? Favorite trade. So we like decompression still over outperformance of investment grade uh, over high yield. Top, top conviction there. Megan Robson of BNP Paribas. Constructive on credit. It's amazing to see how busy things have been to start 2024. Tons of supply, tons of demand, straight out the gate. And at a time when rates haven't gone down that much and they could potentially stay here for quite a while. At a certain point, if the economy does well, people are happy. Although it's so funny. It tells you where we've been that, you know, we heard Tom say, as long as they have earnings. You know, the fact that we had companies with no earnings that borrowed for as long as they did tells you something. Tom, things are getting better. <laughs> that, well, I got to tell you what you just said. Say, gee whiz, I'm glad we're positive on the investment banking stocks. Uh, which is what, you, yes, we Well, we can finish there. You are super constructive, I would say, looking for that reacceleration year round with the one thing that could disrupt it, credit, credit issues. Correct. And we were just talking about it. And those are things like commercial real estate and also consumer credit. 3.7% um, uh, unemployment rate is probably better than we would have expected. We are seeing stress starting to come into the consumer, but it's still the, the companies that are major consumer lenders talk about it as we're getting nor we're normalizing. There isn't a sense that we're breaking out to another level, but that's something that to watch. Hey, Tom, I've loved this. It's great to see you. Good Tom to see there, you KBW, as well. Megan Robson as well from BNP Paribas. Bramo, how long have we been talking about CRE? 
commercial real estate. For how long now? We've Just waiting for that to right. work through the economy and, and waiting. It's been three years. Remember when the pandemic hit, lockdown, Armageddon, and uh, I've been saying that word a lot today. I apologize. I'm going to move back. There was a real question around the survival of office space just in general, and now you have a reset. In certain pockets, still distressed, but it's been basically people think maybe priced in. If you missed the coverage of Bramo in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum, <laughs> constructive. Okay, hold on. I would say on the on. edge of hopeful. No, responding she to She was optimistic. A couple of days back in New York City and it's Armageddon on repeat. <laughs> in the next hour, we'll head to New Hampshire for the latest, plus Priya Misra of JP Morgan Investment Management, Michael Gapen of Bank of America, Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, all of that still to come. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Our sense is the markets are well ahead of themselves in terms of rate cuts. The Fed's telling you they're going to cut, not hike next. And they're pricing probabilistic outcome into this. I actually don't see a huge gap between the market and what the Fed ultimately wants to do. They're going to be taking a read on that macro outlook to figure out when to cut rates. The market's sort of, in my view, a little bit over its skis. Every now and then, things get ahead of themselves. And to us, this is one of these times. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz, together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P just about positive after three days of gains on the S&P 500, the longest daily winning streak of 2024 so far. It's been record high after record high. The financials in the rear view mirror. We're going to be talking about the tech a little bit later on this afternoon. Netflix, the first of the bunch, starting off, kicking off uh, things. We're going to be hearing also from Tesla later in the week, as well as Intel. Here's a key question. How high is the bar? We were hearing yesterday, maybe it's not that high for the tech names, but we've seen disappointments and they've been punished even this morning. So at what point do we get that blowback to this soft landing nirvana versus the opposite, which seems to be pile on this morning? The United States wins, right? The U.S. wins. Let's just focus on tech numbers for now. This is where these big tech firms are. Europe is where they're not. China at the moment is really struggling. The difference between the United States and China this morning, I think we sit on that for a little bit longer. We've got the US at all time highs and China trying to come up with a new plunge protection team to stimulate demand in its equity market. That is night and day in global equities. Two questions or two points. This is sort of a China specific question and, a, and a how much the US and Chinese markets have diverged and economies for that part, uh, given what we've seen. And then you can ask this question about how much the US is alone more broadly. Right? We've seen this with Europe. We've seen this with other countries and other regions. The US has continued to shine, and it has been those big tech names, even at the expense sometimes of everything else. The market's good. The politics is a little bit messy. We can talk about New Hampshire. We're down to two. It's Nikki Haley versus Donald Trump. AMH, we're told repeatedly by many people on this program already in the last 24 hours, this race could be over by tomorrow morning. It does feel like a make or break moment for Nikki Haley. We saw the way Trump sweeped through Iowa. There's potential for Nikki Haley to break through in New Hampshire. It is a place that she spent a ton of time. It's futile ground for her. But the problem is the polls show former president's winning. And then what's her path after that when she's already down her polls in her home state? I feel like a lot of the reports and a lot of the analytics right now has moved beyond Nikki Haley. And for better or for worse, a lot of people are just saying, when will she drop out? Not what is her path to be the candidate? So here is the question. When do people start moving to the policies we've been talking about this morning, the potential for some sort of blanket 10 percent tariff, uh, which, uh, the, uh, which Donald Trump has talked about? Do we start talking about that? When do we start talking about what the U.S. looks like under whoever could win this rematch? I think right now, Bramo, I think the problem that I have and the worry that others share is that we have a foreign policy vacuum at the moment. We've got the United States and the UK struggling to restore order in the Red Sea. And you know what the perception of things right now is of America, that there is weakness and it could well be replaced by strength in the next 12 months. Just how vulnerable of things on the international scene at the moment? Well, I think it says a lot, the fact that you said it's only the US and the United Kingdom that are there in the Red Sea striking back at the Houthis. 
no other countries are joining the United States and the UK when it comes to pushing back on the Houthis and what they are doing to global trade that's in the Red Sea. BlackRock put out a note yesterday where they said that things have changed on the geopolitical front and that when they take a look at geopolitics as a risk point, it has gotten much more front and center than it has in the past, exactly to this point, John, which is that these uncertainties could flare up in ways that people have underpriced. And BlackRock sees this as kind of feeding into an inflationary impulse that has a longer uh, sort of tenure. Marco Kalanovic, JP Morgan, quote in his research, we believe the disinflation process is likely to slow or stall in the first half of 24, in part due to the impact of shipping, supply chain disruptions and upside risk for energy prices. Now, you said you've been getting pushback. Marco Klanovic is speaking for the same hymn sheet with you. It makes sense. I mean, if you just think about it logically, if you have to go all the way around South Africa to have the same kind of voyage, isn't that going to be problematic and add to wait times? Let's get you up to speed on the price action. Equities are positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Equities higher, yields in higher as well by about two basis points. Lisa on a 10-year, 4.12.62. Just creeping higher, but we haven't seen really kind of uh, any fallout in the stock market. I just got to say, still, even though the data has been better than expected, it hasn't really spoken to this reinflationary kind of vibe because you still see inflation expectations coming down. That said, at a certain point, higher yields are going to be a problem for risk assets. Let's get to the top story this morning. Markets at all time highs as tech earnings begin. Investors looking ahead to results and placing their bets on rate cuts. Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex writes in this. Fixed income cut optimism is fading and yields crept back up recently. The general view is that inflation could be stickier than hoped and it will take more time to get to rate cuts. Katie Kaminsky joins us now for more. Katie, let's talk about that spread and welcome to the program. The difference between the perceived view of the Federal Reserve and what the market is priced for right now. How do you expect that spread to reconcile? Well, if you look what happened, I mean, it was a massive, massive reduction in yields. And I think people are just ready to throw in the towel that, you know, it's time for cuts, let's move on. And what we've seen this month is people capitulating a little bit and saying, you know, it's actually not that easy to get inflation down that quickly. It's going to take more time. That doesn't mean we're not in the right path. It just means that this dis disinflation hope is not really sort of going to happen in a month. It's going to take three, six, a few months for them to actually capitulate, for the Fed to also capitulate and say, you know, it, it's time to make cuts. That's how I see it. So then why is long the new short, Katie? Well, long's the new short because we finally saw a pivot in the fixed income market after nine quarters. We were looking for that rates. We were looking for the end of the rate hiking cycle. And when you think about it, I mean, bonds still look good. They still have positive carry. And what we're trying to find now from a technical perspective is a steepener. And I think that's probably what what is the shape of the yield curve is really the question for us right now this year. But it doesn't mean that bonds don't look somewhat attractive. When you say uh, bonds, is there a particular tenor that makes sense to you, especially as we embark with the two-year auction today on $162 billion of Treasury auctions this week alone? Well, let's just say that short-term fixed income is still a really nice return. And then when you look across the yield curve, I'm a little more reticent about long-term bonds because we don't know yet how things are going to play out. I know credit could be an issue. We could see a resurgence in inflation. So my general view is to be a little bit cautionary when you only have a very small premium for long-duration bonds. So a steepener is probably the best position for that. So long the short end, short the long end. Okay, can we pick up on that final point, the prospect of inflation reaccelerating? Marco Kalanovic of JP Morgan saying, we believe the disinflation process is likely to slow or stall in the first half of this year, going on to say in part due to the impact of shipping, supply chain disruptions and upside risk for energy prices. Do you share that concern? Yes, I do. And the reason for this is if you look at the signals recently in the commodity markets, we have been watching for a little bit of an uptick in energy prices. And you've seen that this month. It's just showing us that there are still some large risks that could easily cause some vulnerabilities in those sectors, which may lead to potential pass through effects uh, to companies. So it's just going to take time to get inflation down to what we're used to if we continue to have some issues. Okay, can this, you just build on that year. a little bit more? How much time would it take for those pressures to start showing up? Would you expect that in the next few weeks, the next few months? Where on the calendar would you expect the tension of the last few months to land going forward? 
Well, the thing that's challenging with this is we have to see commodities actually move pretty quickly. I'll just be honest with you. So that's why we're watching them. If you look at what happened during the Ukraine crisis, commodities moved first. So I would expect if we actually have problems, we will see that in the short run rather than the long run. So that would be sort of a catalyst to a longer term move that could potentially affect inflation. Katie, last year you came out and you had the most conviction to short bonds, which was counterintuitive. And for the bulk of the year actually did really well. What's your highest conviction now heading into a 2024 that feels rather convictionless other than the soft landing? So I think the biggest trade that we have seen that surprised us so far is this divergence between U.S. and China and even Japan. I think the best trade this month has been long Japanese equities and short the yen. So that is something that people have been questioning us about for months. And it's surprising that that continues to be um, a very interesting uh, differentiator across the board. Hey, Katie, appreciate the update. Thanks for being with us. Katie Kaminsky there of Alpha Simplex. You'd expect it to show up in energy markets first. Check out crude. AMH still in the 70s, even with what we've been talking about now for months, it's since early October. It's also unbelievable that we're waking up to another night of airstrikes in the Red Sea, and energy prices are down this morning in the red when you look at WTI and Brent. I mean, this is how much is it's just U.S. policy, right? It's basically how much uh, we're pumping. At the same time, you do wonder where the margin of increased production comes from should there be a more material disruption, because this is all just a slow grind, not necessarily some sort of massive, obvious disruption. Also, Libyan oil came back online. People were pointing to that, too. 79.32 on Brent crude. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Aberdeen is preparing to cut hundreds of jobs, according to Sky News. The firm will reportedly announce layoffs and a trading update tomorrow. Aberdeen has declined to comment on the reporting. The UK-based investor has already slashed employee benefits as part of a cost-cutting plan last month. Bitcoin has fallen over 20 percent since its intraday peak on January 11th, when the first spot ETFs debuted on the market. The largest digital asset spiked about four, uh, above 49,000 and is now hovering below 39,000. A net $1.2 billion flowed into the group of nine funds during the first six days of the launch, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. And Liverpool FC is said to be in talks with various media groups about a behind-the-scenes documentary. Bloomberg learning that the club's current manager is supportive of the project after turning down interest from Amazon's All or Nothing series in 2018. Liverpool was part of a subject of a 2012 documentary, Being Liverpool. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Bramo, who isn't doing this? Exactly. Who isn't doing this right now? This is the playbook. Turn your, your say, your sports team into some kind of, you know, drama series or, or dramedy or something like that. Tennis did this. Yeah. Football's been doing it for years. Yeah. Formula One has been doing it. Who isn't doing it? I mean, maybe horse racing. I haven't seen a lot of those. <laughs> start doing that as well. <laughs> I mean, I guess so. I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, aquatic ballet. Aquatic ballet. I watch this. Mohamed Salah, behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people would. I think a lot of people would, but this, this has been the playbook, Bramo. Exactly, because you basically get the money from that, you drum up support, it doesn't really matter if you win or lose, if you create the emotional dramas, the personal stories, then if you win, it's that much more personal. We've seen this again and again, but is this the new playbook outside of, say, that contract that's dependent on advertising revenues, Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, keen to see that Liverpool documentary. Up next on this programme, Haley's last-ditch effort to take down Trump. You've seen the Republican Party coalesce around Donald Trump. There's bigger buzz around who could be his vice presidential pick rather than can Nikki beat him here in New Hampshire. That's next on the program. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Four nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to New Hampshire voters ahead of the primary. New Hampshire is going to speak very loudly. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. Nikki is the one that has knocked all these other candidates out of the race. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path? 
to the nomination. Coverage continues today, only on Bloomberg. One hour and 15 minutes away from the open in Powell Equity Futures on the S&P 500, just about unchanged to positive by almost 0.1%. Yields bleeding a little bit higher by two basis points. Your 10-year, 4.12.62. Under surveillance this morning, Haley's last-ditch effort to take down Trump. What have we seen for the past six months? Head-to-head -head polling that shows Donald Trump potentially beating Joe Biden in many of the swing states. That has been a psychological factor that has been truly underreported. And now there's a feeling of inevitability. You've seen the race, uh, you've seen the Republican Party coalesce around Donald Trump and possibly even there's bigger buzz around who could be his former, uh, who could be his vice presidential pick rather than can Nikki beat him here in New Hampshire. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley squaring off in the New Hampshire primary, a make or break moment for the former UN ambassador. Julian Emanuel of Evercore saying Governor Ron DeSantis endorsement increases the odds Trump wins and helps him, quote, become a virtual lock to become the GOP's nominee. MH, we've said it all morning. It could be over by tomorrow morning. Absolutely. But Terry Haynes talking about Governor DeSantis, where does his voters go? He writes today, the key is how much Haley gets of the around 15% Ghost, Christie and DeSantis New Hampshire vote. Haley needs almost all of that 15% to pull roughly even with Trump. Our instinct is she falls short of it, making Trump a clear favorite and putting Haley's campaign on life support. But a turnout is at or above 300,000 at the New Hampshire Secretary of State predicts Haley could surprise. We have to wait and see. It's not over just yet. But if polls are right, it is. But let's see what the turnout is. Let's head to New Hampshire and catch up with Bloomberg's Kelly Lines. Kelly, can Nikki Haley get it done? It's been described to me as an uphill climb today, John. That, frankly, is, is what we're hearing from almost everyone, that this is going to be very hard for her to, her to pull off. Anne-Marie is absolutely right that this is going to be primarily about turnout today. The Secretary of State, David Scanlon, actually joined Bloomberg yesterday, predicting more than 320,000 voters could turn out to vote in the Republican primary. Americans for Prosperity Action, the super PAC that is supporting Haley, has said something closer to 340,000. But it's going to have to be a number like that, a real turnout, a show of these independent and undeclared voters that could break for Haley that would actually help her uh, potentially cross the finish line. But polls suggest that this is going to be incredibly difficult to pull off. Suffolk University and Boston Globe have a tracking poll. The latest poll this morning on the day of the primary shows Trump at 60 percent, 22 points ahead of Haley. That is the widest spread we have seen this week. And typically, yes, New Hampshire is able to deliver upsets. It's happened historically in the past. But you see candidates who ultimately end up upsetting, gaining in the polls leading up to the day of the vote. And that is not what is happening for Nikki Haley in 2024. Can we talk about the name that's not on the ballot, Kaylee? President Biden is not on the Democratic ballot today. And you caught up with Representative Phillips, who says if he doesn't get a very large showing, if people write in his name, then he's perceived as weak. What did you get a takeaway from that interview? Yeah. Well, it, it was really interesting to hear from Congressman Phillips, who, of course, is competing for the Democratic nomination and has been campaigning here in New Hampshire while P President Biden is not, because President Biden has, with the DNC, together decided that South Carolina should be the first primary because it's uh, of its more diverse base of voters. So that's why there is just a write-in campaign that the president and his campaign can't directly support. It's through different surrogates, like uh, Congresswoman Annie Custer. It's going to be a question of what kind of number Biden actually can put up through that campaign campaign, considering incumbent presidents here in New Hampshire in the past have secured 80 percent plus of the vote. And that is really the marker that Dean Phillips laid in the sand for us when he joined us here at Bloomberg yesterday. He thinks Biden should be putting up something 80 percent uh, plus. If he doesn't, then that's a question of whether or not he is a weak candidate, because that is the message Dean Phillips shared with us, that this is a weak, unelectable incumbent president. He thinks that is dangerous if the goal is to unseat Trump or to make sure that Trump can't once again take the seat in the Oval Office in 2024. And Dean Phillips told us he thinks we'll all be surprised by his showing here in New Hampshire today. He's saying he could maybe get above 20 percent. Well, he's up against some 20 names on that ballot. If we come back to the Republicans in Iowa, within 30 minutes, we knew who won the caucuses. How quickly are we going to see the New Hampshire votes materialize? 
Well, polls will be closed across the state uh, by 8 p.m. tonight, and there has been talk of could we see an 801 call because, yes, the Associated Press and major networks called Iowa about 30 minutes after the caucuses even began. They hadn't even, they hadn't even finished yet at that point. It really is going to come down to how close this race is. The issue in Iowa was that Trump was leading by such an overwhelming margin that it was very clear very early on that neither Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or Vivek Ramaswamy, two individuals who, of course, were still in the race at that point, were going to be able to catch him. If it is a tighter race, than the polls suggest this evening that it may be more difficult to call as early as we saw in the first in the nation caucus. Kaylee, let's talk about weather because everyone was talking about weather in Iowa and that was the reason why turnout was so bad. I'm looking at the weather in New Hampshire. Today it's going to be a high of 38 degrees and a low of 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It seems just fine for New Hampshire. Is that really going to determine uh, turnout? Are you expecting to see some sort of turnout uh, that is much bigger than Iowa? Well, Lisa, I have to say, it feels like the Bahamas here after Iowa last week. This is more than 45 degrees warmer than it was in Iowa. So, yes, weather could play a big factor in driving people out, which may be contributing to some of the high numbers we are seeing from like the likes of the Secretary of State North of 300,000. But really, turnout is driven by enthusiasm in large part, right? And that is another thing we have to consider when we're looking at the polls between Nikki Haley and Donald Trump, is that Trump voters are just must, much more enthusiastic about his candidacy. They are far more likely to say their vote is for him rather than against Haley. With Nikki Haley, a large chunk of her voters are voting against Trump, not necessarily for her, and that enthusiasm gap has been significant. That was the case in Iowa as well. So that could be a real factor here. Does the base of Trump feel more impelled to go out and actually go to the polls and vote today versus those who might not be as excited uh, to go cast a vote for Nikki Haley? That said, on the other side of the coin, you could say that Trump is re leading by such an overwhelming margin right now that some individuals may think he's going to take this anyway, my vote won't matter as much. So it really is the enthusiasm factor in addition to the weather that we have to consider when we ultimately see what the numbers look like today. Kelly, looking forward to the coverage later on. Kelly Lines there in New Hampshire. Look out, tune in to Bloomberg tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern time, complete coverage of the New Hampshire primary. AMH, let's talk about it. That enthusiasm gap is absolutely massive between the former president and Nikki Haley. It's impossible to really run a primary with someone in your party who people feel like is an incumbent. And at the same time, Governor DeSantis, when he was leaving the race, he said, I was picking up steam. And then you couldn't get through the oxygen in media, given the fact that everything was pointed towards Trump and his legal troubles. And Trump made his legal troubles really an election campaign issue. He ignites a lot of emotion on both sides, which is the reason why they say that Nikki Haley's one path would be to sort of ignite the opposite of the love, but the uh, the alternative to love that some people feel toward uh, Donald Trump. So this is sort of the question. Is it a referendum on him? A lot of people saying you're seeing the coalescing of the Republican Party. I, I've got to say, I'm not that jazzed. I feel like we, people have moved on. I feel like it's sort of gotten this sort of inevitability about it at this point. You know what's amazing much. about this, though? If, if Nikki Haley did become the candidate, the win that we would see on the national stage, how oh, big yeah. it would be, it would be absolutely humongous. And that just tells you how deeply unpopular the current sitting president actually is. No one wants this outcome. I say no one to use that loosely, but ultimately you look at the polls, MH, they speak for themselves. Yeah, the polls show that Americans do not want a rematch of this race, but that's exactly what they're going to get. The next few months is all going to be about what does the Trump campaign look like in swing state votes versus what is Biden doing in these swing states. And you're going to see a lot of visits like you are this week to Wisconsin, to Michigan, to these states that are must win because that's where elections are won and lost. Forget the nationals. Yeah, but what does it say that a candidate that would be so easy to win on the national stage looks so impossible to win on the primary stage. And that tells you a lot of the polarization that we've seen uh, in the different parties. It's a question of why America chooses candidates this way. Why was $75 million spent in New Hampshire where there's 830,000 registered votes? Or why does the first caucus start in Iowa? I think I should move to New Hampshire and just get a check. To New Hampshire. Honestly, it's good, great skiing. It's a good, good skiing. I didn't know that. You yeah, skied there. Yeah, yeah, it's great skiing. Okay. And you can vote in primaries and maybe exactly. have an impact. You could go and, and do the coverage tonight with the team. Kelly Lines, Joe Matthew. Yeah, like could head up. You'll be wearing my, you know, balaclava. Go on and the slopes afterwards. Yeah, exactly. No, that's not going to happen. Coming up on the program, <laughs> Michael Gapen of Bank of America looking ahead to some critical inflation data due out later this week and looking forward to a Federal Reserve meeting just around the corner. Before we get there, it's the ECB. Michael Gapen thinks you get a rate cut as soon as March and you get a soft landing too. 
That conversation is just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.1%. Yields are higher by two basis points, 4.12.62. Consensus is maybe the middle of this year, but Michael Capon's got company. Jan Hatsius of Goldman talking to our team in Hong Kong, Bramo about a little more of the same, March cuts. March cuts, soft landing. What else do you get, an ice cream? I mean, seriously, these are incredible projections. Rainbows, unicorns, exactly. and lollipops, and all that That's good stuff. That's where we're headed. Soft landings and tons of rate cuts and all-time highs in the equity market. Great. Coverage, <laughs> up next. Stocks on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.1% on the Nasdaq 100 going into the opening bell. About an hour from now, we're positive by a third of 1%. The Russell bouncing back up by 0.8. Talked about it all morning. It's not about the financials anymore. Bramo, it's about big tech a little bit later. Netflix kicking off the big tech earnings later today at 4 p.m. Eastern. And then we get Tesla and Intel. And then next week we get really some of the big behemoths. The question is how low is the bar or how high is the bar at a time when this has really been the driving force behind the entire rally. It's my favorite time of the year. You get the tech earnings and the Federal Reserve decision around the same time. Is that sarcasm? No, I'm serious. <laughs> I actually... I'm serious. You get tech earnings I prefer. I, I told the bankers in Davos this last week. I wish they would deliver the earnings after the bell and not before the bell all at once in the morning. I know. I know. I knew we were you going to You never get to read them. Then you've got a bunch of earnings calls. Then the market opens up. Everyone's busy. In the afternoon, after the close, tech comes out, you can actually sit there and read the earnings and listen to the calls. And that's actually going to be hugely instructive because the reason why the U.S. has diverged from everywhere else, China in particular, has been because of the big tech names. And they've been the ones that have been leading. The key question to me, though, is are you going to see a broadening out in some of the earnings? Because we're also getting, I think, 5 percent of the S&P today reporting earnings. We got a bunch of the uh, industrials. So around the margins, the next two weeks are going to be massive, just more broadly for earnings. Luke Carr of UBS looking for that improvement of breadth in the equity market, just broader participation maybe. What a turn to the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. We'll be joined by a gentleman who's looking for a rate cut in March in just a moment. A two-year at the moment, around 440, 439.97. Yield tied by two basis points on a 10-year, 412.24. Just to finish on foreign exchange, I keep reminding myself of this. I'm not trying to remind you at home. There is an ECB meeting this week. We're at 108.67 on the euro, negative by 0.1%. I'd forgotten, to be honest with you, this one's come around quickly. We already had it last week. You pointed it out. We Twice. had it a couple times with Christine Lagarde. They're not going to say anything, right? I mean, what are they possibly going to say that's going to move markets, given the fact that people are basically expecting them to cut rates in the summer, which is essentially what she said last week at her press conference with Francine Lagarde. News conference round three. Yes. It's going to be far more interesting. How many journalists are going to ask about the politics of the United States, whether it's appropriate to weigh in to US politics, her response to the reports around the dissatisfaction of the staff inside the European Central Bank. There's a lot to discuss for the ECB leader this Thursday. Yeah, although I can't imagine she can back away very easily because she already has weighed into the politics. So at this point, does she double down on that? Does she justify it? Or does she explain how that folds into monetary policy and why that's relevant to her job? And she's weighed into the politics in so many different ways. It was with France 24. It was with fireside chats uh, at Davos. It was on large panels where she said Europe needs to go on the attack. But I think at some point a journalist does need to ask, is it appropriate? Would you see Jay Powell answering a question at a press conference about Emmanuel Macron or Olaf Scholz? Or even at home, Donald Trump. I mean, just avoid it. Avoid it like the plague. We should send Mike McKee to Frankfurt this week on Thursday. <laughs> He'll still be last. Get McKee to answer. Yeah, <laughs> He'll still have true. the last question, 100%. Be. Let's turn to your top stories. Under Savannah's this morning, United Airlines reporting better than expected earnings, but saying it expects to lose money as a result of the Boeing 737 MAX 9 grounding. CEO Scott Kirby venting his frustrations over Boeing management and its handling of the situation, even taking the issue to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Where is Pete Buttigieg on this story? Well, Pete Buttigieg is basically saying that they've conveyed to Boeing how they feel and they want to make sure that they're getting answers. But, you know, the fact that they're airing frustrations to the White House, what is the White House supposed to do in this instance? They say they're monitoring it, but this really isn't a decision for the West Wing. The FAA needs to go through their process. I got to say, I was really scared of flying as a kid. And then I started to fly a lot, and then it didn't really matter because it was always going to be safe. It's very disconcerting 
to see burning planes and to have this as a concern, even if it's not justified. Flying is still very safe. It's safer than driving a car or walking across the street. I get it, I get it, I get it. But, sure. you know, there is this sort of, like, why do we have to worry about this, too? Look, stories will spook you. Remember TK talked about the turbulence that he experienced on a flight, and he said he looked behind him and he said that a woman was stuck to the ceiling. Do you believe that? Not lying. I'm flying back from Zurich and I'm standing up and we hit a little bit of turbulence and I look up at the ceiling. <laughs> You're looking for the woman on the top of the ceiling. And I go back to my seat. Let's turn to this story. <laughs> New Hampshire voters casting their ballots in the GOP primary between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. Anti-Trump Republicans looking to rally behind Haley in what might be the last chance to avoid a Trump-Biden rematch. Haley will look ahead to her home state of South Carolina next month if she can pull off an upset. It's unthinkable. AMH that we're talking about this ending before she even gets to her home state. What she's trying to do is bring out the independents who don't want a rematch, like the majority of Americans don't want a rematch of Trump versus Biden. And what Haley says constantly is, look at how I poll versus the former president against Biden. I am leading him 17, 20 percent in a general election. At the same time, it looks like the Republicans are going to go with the incumbent in the primary, which is Donald Trump which we're all really excited about. You said that you were excited about this uh, this campaign. I think that maybe uh, you'll have to give us some of your excitement because I think a lot of us are a little bit frustrated about, you know, just this sort of divergence between what people want and what they're getting. And it seems like there's nothing that anyone can totally. do. Totally. Politics worldwide. Politics 100 percent worldwide. Put it very well. I see it across the board. I want to get to this from Goldman, the chief economist, Jan Hatzius, speaking to Bloomberg, weighing in on the Fed's tightrope. The Fed is on its way to achieving uh, the soft landing. Obviously, no guarantees, but I like what I'm seeing. That was Jan Hassis of Goldman sticking with his base case for a March rate cut. The cues, a still resilient labor market, consumer prices and comments from Chairman Powell about cutting before inflation returns to 2%. Here's another man who thinks you might get a March rate cut. This from Mike Gapen of Bank of America with the following quote. Look for a reversal of December's strength in January. Consumer spending may be healthy, but it's not surging or slumping. And we don't think the report, the recent report that we got for retail sales, says much about the Fed's ability to cut rates beginning in March, as we expect. Michael Gapen joins us around the table. Morning, Mike. Good morning. March rate cuts, even with that data last week. Yeah, we think the retail sales data was really influenced by the seasonals, right? The pulling forward of consumer spending into October and November and the difficulty with the seasonals adjusting for it. So we think it's more noise than signal and it'll reverse in January. What else is telling you that, given the fact that all the other economic data has also come in better than expected? Well, I think in, in this case, we, we can point to seasonals being you know, about 2.2 percentage points more favorable this December than they were last December. So it should kind of wipe out any underlying signal. But beyond that, it's really what gets them to cut in March is the inflation data. That even if the activity side of the economy is doing well, as, as it is, um, it's really the deceleration in inflation and the fact that we're you know, six or seven months with annualized core PCE running at 2% or less. So as we roll into the March meeting, it, I think they get gradually more confident about the trajectory. A March rate cut, and yet do you still lean into, or I know that you don't lean into this idea of six rate cuts, that you see right. something more like four or er, maybe Early even... but gradual, right. yes, so four, four for this year. How do they communicate what their goal is, what their sort of terminal rate is? We heard Bill Gross yesterday, the famed bond investor, say they're basically pinpointing this and paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. They're basically, you know, throwing a dart at a wall because they don't have a sense of what that neutral rate is. So how do you get a handle on what they're going to be looking for and how they're going to be signaling? Well, you never truly know where the neutral rate is, right? And that shouldn't stop you from making decisions that you think are, are the right policy decisions. So I, I think what they will communicate is, is that we're on track for achieving 2%. And to avoid policy from getting too tight, we're going to follow inflation down. Doesn't mean we're easing. We're not, we're not easing in response to a recession. We're just we're normalizing the policy stance, preserving some policy rate tightness and guiding inflation lower. It's a little tricky because we've never done this before, but I think they can do it. Bob Diamond sat in your chair yesterday and he said the bar is much higher as they come down than it was as they were hiking rates. Do you agree with that? Meaning that the closer you get to where you think neutral is, you should be a little more conservative. Yeah, I think that's right. But that's like, so I, th I think you heard that through Governor Waller's comments, right, that we we should go gradual. It's going to allow us to be methodical and evaluate things as we go along. This isn't recession cut early, cut fast, cut deep. This is move, move gradually and methodically. And yes, you'll have to find your way as you get towards the end. If they're going in March, wouldn't you expect them to tee that up next week? 
Not entirely. I think that they'll move to a more kind of balanced language, right? They'll remove, we think, the upside bias to the policy rate path and talk about future adjustments to, to the policy rate. So it'll be more, more two-sided. I think that's about all they can do. So remember, they see effectively three more inflation reports. They see the one this week, the one for February, and they'll get CPI and PPI heading into the March meeting. So they'll have the clean read. So there's a lot of data that could still move it. Neil Dutch of Renaissance Macro agrees with you that this is the direction of travel. You heard something similar from Jan Hansius of mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs as well. I give you another view from Marco Klanovic over at JP Morgan, who just looks at the tension emerging in the Red Sea at the moment and the prospect that we get a pickup, a reacceleration in goods inflation again. What would you say to that? And certainly possible, but when we look at the, the data about where the U.S. gets its trade flows and its goods imports from, not a lot goes through the Red Sea, and, and we think that that type of impact could be pretty minimal. I've read report after report about a reacceleration in housing markets, especially as rates come down, a reacceleration in a whole host of businesses in response to the expected rate cuts coming this year. Are we not talking anymore about the fact that the market's already priced in the rate cuts for the Fed, and so basically we've already done it? Well, that's right. So the, the, the Fed's just going to be essentially validating at least some of what, what markets are pricing in. And yes, there's a risk that they've shifted too early in this direction, and later in the year the easing in financial conditions will cause things to be more robust than they want. But I, I think on, on net we're pretty comfortable with saying the inflation data tells them they, they should be easing. We think that happens in, in March, and, and, they, you know, and risks are balanced around that. On a scale from 1% to 100%, how high is your conviction about a soft landing? Why are uh, you laughing at me? Uh, <laughs> it's true. 88.2. <laughs> we get that sometimes. 60, 65%. Really? Yeah. How much has that increased over the past couple of months? Well, we, in the last couple of months, I'd say it's been about the same. I mean, really, the change for us was last summer. Right when we, we were one of the mild recession camp people, but the rebound in the supply side, the return of the labor force in large numbers really changed the scenario for us. Just how weak is the labor market right now? I get so many conflicting messages about that. I think we sit around this table, we look at claims 187, which yeah. is remarkable. I've lost count of the amount of months we've stayed below 4% on unemployment. And yet we get a couple of people coming on the program saying there's weakness emerging here. Do you see the same thing? I think you can point to weakness in the, the narrowness of employment gains, right? Virtually all private sector employment is still coming from these catch-up sectors, the high-touch, face-to-face, leisure, hospitality, education, and health. So I, th I think the numbers are private payrolls have averaged 134,000 per month over the last six months. 127 of that come from these two sectors. So growth, employment growth in the rest of the private sector is basically flat, right? So the risk is if that catch-up of fade catch-up effect fades much more quickly than we all think, does private employment slow down to zero? Do we get that recession risk? Or has the Fed shifted its tune early enough, the rest of the economy gets supported into the second half of the year of gains in employment in those sectors come back? Is that what's driving this decision ultimately for the March cut? in your mind, or is the disinflationary trends that have emerged, are they enough? Is that sufficient? I think that's sufficient, but a little softness in the underlying data would certainly help their case to, to go in March. Mike, it's good to see you. It's great to have you back. Michael Gapin there of Bank of America on that March rate cut and the prospect of Brammo a soft landing. Yeah, 65% chance, 88.2, is that what you said? 65.1, yeah, 88.2. 88. <laughs> 65, honestly, I'm pleased you asked the question because 65 is not sort of like right up there, high right. conviction. So it raises this question, what could go wrong? And of course, I'm very curious course, about that because that, I'm going to focus on that 35% chance intensely. That things could go wrong. <laughs> Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Shares of GE falling in pre-market trading after the firm's outlook for the current quarter fell short of the street's expectations. The manufacturer is in the process of separating its aerospace and energy businesses into standalone entities by early April after spinning off its healthcare operations in 2022. Johnson & Johnson posted fourth quarter results that beat estimates thanks to a rally in medical device sales and pharma revenue. J&J &J is narrowing its focus on high margin ventures ahead of an expected drop off in sales for popular drug Stellara. Cheaper alternatives are expected to hit the U.S. market early next year.
TKO Group appoints actor and professional wrestler Dwayne Johnson to its board of directors effective today. The owner of WWE says in a statement that it has also entered into a services and merchandising agreement with Johnson that provides for his promotional and licensing services. Shares of TKO Group are soaring in pre-market trading on the back of the news that Netflix bought rights to its show, Raw. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on the program, will the Fed begin to signal cuts? I would stop uh, quantitative uh, tightening. I, I think that's um, just not a, a correct uh, philosophy and policy at this point in time. That's next on the program. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from New York City, equities right now positive by 0.2% on the S&P 500. The opening bell is just around a corner with yields higher by two basis points on the 10-year. 4.12.05. Under surveillance this morning, all eyes on Fed cuts. I would stop uh, quantitative uh, tightening. I, I think that's um, just not a, a correct uh, philosophy and policy at this point in time to um, you know, continue to uh, tighten quantitatively. They should leave the, you know, the, the reserve balance around uh, seven trillion dollars and just uh, um, see what happens going forward. Pimco's Bill Gross weighing in on the Fed. The former Pimco chief weighing in on what the Federal Reserve will do next. J.P. Morgan's Priya Misra seconding the motion, writing, "We think that the Fed will taper." QT in the next few months. The Fed is trying to finesse the lowest level of reserves to prevent a situation similar to the repo spike Lisa, in 2019. I'm very curious about what's going to happen with the balance sheet. Instead, the conversation has been entirely dominated by when the Fed's going to cut their rates the first time. And I got to say, a big amount of dissent between whether it matters, whether it's March or June. Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed writing, uh, writing quote, in response to uh, some of the rally that we've seen in equities, the chink in the armor at the moment is rate expe expectations. Indeed, futures are now pricing in just a 42% chance of a Fed rate cut by March, which is a big shift from the end of 2023 when a cut by March was fully priced in. John, does it matter if it's March or if it's May or if it's June, if the direction is known? You get different answers from different people. I'm not going to answer that. Priya Mishra is. Portfolio Manager at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Priya, does it matter? I don't think so. I mean, if you're trading the March Fed fund contracts, it, it does matter. Of course. If you're trading the two-year or the 10-year or equities or any asset class, what matters is the end point. How much are they cutting? For what, what is the reason that they're cutting? Are they trying to normalize? Are they actually trying to ease policy? I mean, I, I would argue the market's pricing in these rate cuts. And whether they start in March or May or June, if they're going to cut all the way to three and a quarter, uh, I would argue they can actually cut lower than that. You know, they think that long-term rates in a soft landing scenario is closer to two and a half. I would say two and a half to three percent then that is still normalizing policy. That's actually good for risk assets. It means bond deals have some more room to decline. If the economy turns and now they are cutting fast and they're cutting below that two and a half level, then you've got to be really nervous around risk assets. All right, and we'll get into exactly what could trigger that. But I am curious, one thing that people do say to me, the reason why March matters is because of the political backdrop. And they say there's no way that the Fed's going to want to be aggressively cutting right ahead of the election. It's going to be tricky. It's going to complicate things. So why not front load it and get ahead of it? Do you buy that? I don't. I, I think the Fed has enough things to focus on. I think politics, they're going to, it's difficult. They are going to get you know, dragged into the, the entire political debate. But I would argue they have a framework. They've got a dual mandate. Inflation is allowing them to cut. I mean, we're going to get inflation numbers of three months, six month moving averages are running below 2%. That is their target. So what we're hearing from the Fed is, well, we can start. I think they can be slow the earlier they start. And, and that's still a big question. I'm not convinced that they'll get enough. Let's see. The revisions will come out. I love Governor Waller brought up revisions for and, and I know you'll be looking at it for bond geeks. We look at revisions because the, the market always reacts to that in the, the initial number. Let's look at revisions. If the inflation picture is still weak, if we are still seeing immaculate disinflation, the inflation backdrop is allowing the Fed to cut. And I think they start, whatever happens with, with politics, I think at least start the normalizing 
though I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure they'll be dragged in, but I think it, it really doesn't... Uh, is it hope you know, or is it it's conviction? What do you think? Which one is it? <laughs> what you think they should do or what they will do? It's always tricky. We all have to think about what they will do, and I think they're trying so hard to keep the soft landing going. I think what inflation's allowed them, I've always felt soft landing, it's rare, uh, historically. I felt it's a very narrow path. I think the Fed has looked at that path, seen inflation and said, let's broaden it out. Let's start, uh, you know, cutting rates. Let's taper QT. I think that's very interesting. They're trying to reduce the level of restrictiveness in the economy to allow that soft landing to last. Whether they can do it, whether there's no non-linear effect that actually results in a recession, I think that's still an open question. Let's get to the bond market call. Ten year right now, 412. We caught up in the last few months and you reduced some of your long duration exposure around 380. We're back at about 4.12. You think you were looking for 4.20 before you started buying again and going long. Is that right? It is, but what's eight basis points among friends? Well, you tell me. Are we so, in no man's land or not? I would argue, I think we, we're going to be in a 3.75 to four and a quarter type range. So I think as you start getting to that 4.20, 4.25, I think adding some duration, particularly we've added to risk. And I would argue with the inflation backdrop, with the Fed saying that, hey, we can actually start to normalize, correlations between duration and risk assets are going to come back. We haven't had that, that, that correlation in a long time. But I would argue that that's what allows us to actually start to add some duration in case the economy worsens, that, that duration hedge will come back. And then, you know, we talk about fundamentals, but I think what's changed in the last few weeks for me is I look at technicals. Look at all the uh, investment rate supply that's actually come into the market, all got taken down well. I think the economy, or I think investors have been structurally underweight fixed income. As they are coming back, that six trillion sitting in money market funds starts to come into bond funds. That can mean even 412 is not a bad level. Maybe don't put all of it in, but start adding to duration. Uh, you know, anything above four percent, I think, is attractive. When you talk about risk, are you talking about duration, or are you going full bull and going into high yield bonds? We, you know, we're in a soft landing right now. We're looking at the data, and the data looks strong. I mean, I think. Uh, the economy is normalizing. And so I would say even high yield investment rate, the high quality high yield, I think is attractive. Um, securitized credit, investment rate credit. I think you just have to do a lot of credit work because there's going to be zombie companies in there. Try, it's hard. Make sure you don't own any of that or at least try. But I would say spreads look attractive. When was the last time you were this bullish? Uh, well, bullish risk assets, I, I, it's been a while. Um, I would say because the Fed was raising rates significantly and Inflation really surprised me. The supply side came back much faster than I thought. And the Fed, I think, took that opportunity faster than I thought. I mean, in September, they were talking about higher for longer. And I was thinking, oh, there's no way they're cutting rates until the end of 24. They've opened that path. So I guess I'm more bullish risk than I remember for a long, long time or since real rates went into positive territory. Something you said just a moment ago jumped out for me. You said something like we're in a soft landing right now. The right now piece of it. I remember when you were talking about a hard landing. When you say right now, do you mean like a period of time, a moment, but ultimately at the end of the year we're looking at something else? I think there's a chance of that something else. And it's not 5% that the market's pricing in. I think the market is pricing in very low chance of a hard landing. 35%, I th you know, 40% chance of hard landing, I think is still there. Because when you look at the details of the data, it's not all that robust. You, you start looking at the narrowness of the labor market or the fact that, you know, there's, there's pockets of weakness elsewhere. So I would say there is a chance that things slow down or the Fed doesn't cut fast enough or they continue QT long enough. And that's when that chance of something going wrong, I think we always have to be positioned for that. And I think it's there by year It end. sounds like you believe there's a window here to be constructive risk. And what I would like to know from your perspective is what it looks like when the window starts to close. What are you looking out for? So, so beyond data, I would be looking at, again, every revision, you know, the, the details of every economic data. But beyond the economic data, what I'm looking at is real rates. If real rates, 10-year real rates get back to 2% or higher, that's restrictive. I mean, I know we talk about financial conditions all the time. Financial conditions are restrictive. That window starts to close if they stay restrictive or they become more restrictive. You know, and, and that's going to depend on data. It's going to depend on what the Fed does. And that's when I'll get nervous that they did not cut rates fast enough and that restrictiveness is going to show up. Remember, we've had that lock-in effect. The lags are much longer because we are locked in a low level of rate, corporates, households. When that lock-in effect starts to go away and you have to start paying those real rates, start, you know, that's when... Well, Lisa can enjoy a 2% mortgage for another 
25 years or something uh -huh. like That's that. Right, She's going to keep reminding us about it. Priya, it's good to see you. Priya Misra of JP Morgan Asset Management. Are you happy that Priya put a number on things for you? I, well, I actually think it's hilarious because we now have consensus. We've got JP Morgan and we've got Bank of America. 35% chance things go bad. 65% chance that we've got rainbows and unicorns. True. It's true. But in the meantime, the window's there. Buy risk. Exactly. Buy credit. And those most bullish on risk that uh, Priya's been for a while. That's interesting to me. Didn't get to politics, though, did we? Oh, sh no. Well. <laughs> Good reason. Probably. New Hampshire, the primaries, that's what's to watch a little bit later on this evening. The team's going to guide you through that at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television tomorrow. Absolutely stacked program on Bloomberg Surveillance. We'll catch up with the IBM Vice Chair Gary Cohn, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Kathy Jones from Charles Schwab, Cities, Andrew Hollenhorst. All of that still to come as we count you down to the up and bow. 34 minutes to go. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P. From New York City this morning, good morning. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.